yeah, why don't we get started? Um, so um, I'd like to welcome everyone to New Adventures in American Studies, um, which is sponsored by the University of California at Berkeley English Department, African American Studies Department, American Cultures Center, American Studies Program, Ethnic Studies Department, and Center for Race and Gender. Um, we have three conversations today. Um, our first um, conversation features Edgar Garcia in conversation with um, Fred Moten about Edgar's great book, Signs of the Americas. Okay, I'll leave it to you all. Thank you all so much. Thanks so much, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Brian. It's, it's great to be here. It's totally great to be here with you, Edgar, and um, to celebrate your book, which is wonderful. And uh, I've been looking forward to talking with you about it for a while now. So, um, man, I, well, <laughs> Um, I, I guess maybe I, I'll start off in, in what might seem to be a kind of random, well, actually, I wanted to congratulate you not only on that book, um, but also on Skins of Columbus, a dream ethnography. Um, and, and I'm, it's two amazing books and they feel to be to me as a reader, to be totally entangled with one another, um, mm. totally bound up with one another in a way that that kind of connects up with the fact that that maybe criticism and poetry are just totally bound up with one another all the time anyway, uh, in, in, a, in a way which makes me, uh, which, which actually feels like, you know, it's, it, it's entirely undecidable which one of these uh, entangled particles is the poetry in which one of them is the criticism. Maybe they're, um, maybe they're both, but they both are, um, they both are both. Anyway, I, I wanted to acknowledge um, Skins of Columbus as well as Signs of the Americas and just say, see if maybe you wanted to say something about how, how poetry and criticism work together, not only in Signs of the Americas, but also just more generally in the way that you think about things. Thanks, Fred. It's a real honor to be here uh, because your own work has been so enabling for my work. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, uh, and so I not only find your work a blessing, I find your conversation a blessing here today and always. So thanks. Your words mean so much to me. Um, and your questions uh, really um, get at the heart of um, uh, not only what animates um, uh, both books, but what problematizes them uh, too. Uh, um, uh, uh, what problematics or difficulties or conceptual challenges uh, come up uh, when uh, uh, one works uh, at the um, intersection of the crossroads of criticism and um, poetry. Uh, and I could ask you the same question, and maybe I will in a moment, because I'd love to hear your take on it. Uh, 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 but I'll answer it in a, in, a, in, a, in a biographical, pragmatic way, and then I'll try to build on that um, uh, to conceptualize a little bit. Uh, but for me, the relation between Signs of the Americas uh, and Skins of Columbus, and just a quick gloss for people who don't know, Signs of the Americas is a book um, uh, that argues that the indigenous sign systems of the Americas, uh, sign systems such as uh, pictography, picture writing, hieroglyphs, Maya hieroglyphs, uh, Andean Kipu, um, uh, petroglyphs, rock writing, are not dead sign systems mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, or inert sign systems, but very much a part of a living present, uh, working their formal effects. Um, 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 on contemporary literature, visual arts, legal philosophy, uh, environmental thinking, uh, and activism, and various other um, intellectual and disciplinary uh, domains. So its fundamental point uh, is that these are not dead sign systems, but very much a part of a, a, a living present. And Skins of Columbus uh, is a book of um, um, uh, poetry. Uh, and essays, um, uh, 
uh, fictocritical essays, uh, anthropological by way of the personal essays um, um, that uh, explore the dream uh, as a repository of historical uh, um, uh, knowledge. Um, and its take on the dream is not a Freudian take on the dream. So it's not something like um, the individual is crystallized in um, something like universal dream consciousness. Uh, it uh, wants to see what of colonial subconscious, the co colonial history of the Americas is reticulated, webbed in my sleeping mind. Uh, mm -hmm. So what that means, the practical terms, was for the three months during which Columbus traveled the coasts of the Americas, three and a half or so months during which he traveled the coasts of the Americas on his first voyage here, I read his journal entries before going to sleep at night, uh, uh, read the journal entry for the coming day, thinking intently on the plots, symbols, motives, landscapes, figures, to make myself dream Columbus's journals. Notes throughout the night recorded the dreams, and in the days I wrote the um, poetry, essays, and made the visual art of that book. Um, so while the first book is about science systems, and the uh, the first, the scholar, the work of scholarship is about um, the indigenous science systems of the Americas, and the uh, poetry book, let's call it, um, is about um, uh, 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 dreams as um, uh, living archives. Um, uh, to me, they are both uh, about uh, a broader range of intextualization that has uh, been consistently uh, disparaged, ignored, um, um, said not to be text, uh, said not to be knowledge bearing, said not to be theory bearing. And uh, the impetus that brings you know, it brings me to both of those projects is a desire to embrace that which I think needs embracing. Uh, the knowledge systems, the theory bearing, uh, formal and intellectual systems of the Americas, the histories of the Americas in their negative and positive lights, um, the, the, the world in which um, I both have an intellectual uh, heritage and I don't have an intellectual heritage because of colonialism yeah. and, and, the, and the gaps that are produced by uh, the abhoria, uh, the, the negative spaces that are uh, produced by colonialism. Um, so they are um, uh, both in a way analeptic works, um, uh, Signs of the Americas ends on a big chapter and theorization of analepsis. And here I'm getting into the conceptual stuff. Um, mm. uh, and analepsis is the trope of unforgetting. Yeah. of um, uh, feeling remembrance because you've forgotten something um, mm -hmm. and working to remember something. Um, it's not quite retro projection, although sometimes it's used as a synonym for retro projection. It's the feeling of unforgetting uh, mm -hmm. that uh, conceptually uh, uh, brings those two books together. Uh, so indeed, while um, the critical angle is strong in both works, um, they're also um, uh, works that are steeped in a feeling of love, um, uh, in a feeling of uh, love for what I think needs to be loved in the world. It, it's okay. There's like a billion things I want to talk about now. It's like um, part of what I wanted. So maybe I'll just I'm just going to throw some stuff out, and and cool. and you you take whichever one you want to take. Um, All right. One is the, the relation between sign and skin. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, there's like a whole bunch of stuff around ideas of not only inscription, but also touch and feel, you know, mm. feeling that, mm -hmm. that to, to follow up on what you just said. And I'm, so I'm interested in the, the relationship between, you know, between the sign and the skin. Um, yeah. And, uh, also, at the same time, this question of analepsis, of, of unforgetting, mm -hmm. and its relation to love, right? The, the, the way in which we strive to unforget mm. the objects of our affection and even desire. Mm. Um, what it means, as you said, to talk to, 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 to unforget the things in the world that need to be loved. <laughs> now, how do we deal with the ways that unforgetting the things in the world that need to be loved 
sometimes seem to require a kind of love or a kind of act of love that is directed towards things in the world that we kind of feel don't need to be loved, that they yeah. shouldn't be loved, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, obviously, one thing that ought not be loved is, is colonialism. Right. And yet, the recovery of what needs to be loved, the unforgetting of what needs to be loved that you're doing very, very consciously and brilliantly in both these works requires something like a practice of love that, that is extended towards Columbus, towards <laughs> Bronislav Malinowski, towards Charles Olson. How, how does, how do we, Look, it's a it's an ethical dilemma that I'm constantly caught up in myself, and um, and I'm 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 wondering you if you'll. I'm hoping we can we can say something about that too. Um, yeah, it's, and and it's, maybe even these maybe these two things have something to do with one another. Even though, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> uh, the this is kind of like a meditation on mediation. Yeah. Um, uh, um, and um, the. Uh, colonial mediation through which uh, so much of um, indigenous um, uh, knowledge, systems, social histories, um, uh, cultural objects uh, get to the present moment. Uh, how do you read through and around um, uh, uh, or in that, uh, maybe most properly? Um, and it's an imperfect science, uh, I would say, because it's not a science. Um, it's um, um, it's it's um, uh, it's a critical intervention. And taking your own words, so we had a conversation yesterday, and you said some words that really resonated with me, which is critique is what happens in the wake of love. Um, uh, that um, you start off with a feeling that you want to hold something something that needs holding, but to get at that thing, you gotta break so many other things apart. Uh, you gotta um, uh, abstract, deconstruct, de defamiliarize, and um, in many instances, take down. And for me, uh, uh, embracing the cultural histories of the Americas has therefore, in that very sort of framework way of thinking, um, has entailed uh, uh, staying in the problem dealing directly with the devil at the crossroads of literary literature and anthropology and the devil at the crossroads is malinowski um, um, uh, is um, uh, literary ethnography um, uh, uh, the bringing together of our you know of, of the shared roots uh, of literature and anthropology in phylogenetic frameworks in search of um, linguistic and cultural origins. That's that's where these disciplines come from. Uh, and rather than sidestep or <laughs> avoid that, you know, my access point <laughs> to these um, bodies of knowledge um, uh, could be otherwise. I've just gone directly into it in the same way that I go directly into uh, Columbus. But my claim is, here's, here's, here's how, I, how it gets impacted differently, uh, yeah. but my claim is that's not the only form in the field um, of, 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 of inquiry when you do that. Uh, when you engage with a book like the Popo Vuh, so I just finished this new book on the Popo Vuh called Emergency. I wrote mm -hmm. it during the pandemic, nine chapters dealing with uh, a contemporary crisis uh, 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 through the formal frameworks of the Popo Vuh. Uh, what I feel enables me to do that is that the Popo Vuh calls itself a formal framework. It calls itself an ilb all, uh, instrument for seeing. Uh, and not only does it present itself as theoretical framework, literally presenting itself as theoretical framework, it presents itself as theoretical framework within a colonial context. It begins here in the time of the preaching of Christ, here in Christendom, we will bring light out of the darkness. We will bring the world into existence. If there's not a more radical insistence that the formal frameworks 
texts of the indigenous cultures of the Americas also um, can absorb, also mm -hmm. uh, can integrate, also can configure uh, it, uh, their colonial context. I don't know what is. It's just mm -hmm. absolutely literal, straightforward. Like we are in colonialism, and still, um, uh, these um, forms uh, can capture, reconfigure, uh, uh, rearticulate, and uh, highlight um, other ways of thinking, seeing that, um, uh, you know, uh, certainly aren't to be romanticized either, uh, yeah. uh, but, you know, are, 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 um, are, are for me very important uh, to highlight and bring forward. Um, so that's how the mediation gets mediated. So that Popol Vuh book actually has a, has a, has a chapter called Television, in which I read all the adaptations of the Popol Vuh, and there have been several, the televisual adaptations, uh, most weirdly um, by Werner Herzog. Herzog, Sfada Morgana, has yeah. a voiceover by Lotta Eisner where she's reading from the Popol Vuh. I read Herzog through the Popol Vuh's ideas about mediation, right? Um, uh, to see what changes of Herzog when we take the Popol Vuh's formal frameworks seriously. Um, yeah. um, having said that, though, and this is just yeah. kind of to like, you know, give a little bit more um, uh, 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 political scaffolding to the ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Popol Vuh insists upon itself as a work of world literature that bears its own idea of what is a world. Mm -hmm. But, and this is also really important for my work and really important for that book and for my books, but it also uh, is um, a critical instrument for local indigenous struggles in uh, Mexico and Guatemala to this day. So mm -hmm. uh, that book also talks about uh, the EZLN and the um, Avispas political groups in Chiapas and in Central America uh, who make their claims uh, or, or make their critiques, excuse me, make the critiques of the Mexican government and of neoliberal governance through the figures of the Popol Vuh. So they'll say like the, the Mexican state is seven macaw and the Supreme Court is, or you know, seven macaw has two sons, Cabracan and Zipacna. And the Supreme Court is Cabracan and, um, 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 and Zipacna is the military showcasing how this <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, uh, very old Kitsche story of creation uh, carries um, um, formal theoretical uh, uh, social potential to this very moment. Is it the thing that I guess I'm really interested in, man? And and okay, okay. So there's all this stuff running through my mind. Okay, now. And I can't wait to read this book, <laughs> this book on the, on the Popol Vuh. And, and I, I hope it's, there's a, there's an essay by Sylvia Winter that I got obsessed with about a year ago. And I just keep reading it over and over and over again. And it's called Socio, Ethno or Socio-Poetics. Oh yeah, it was in, it was in El Caringa. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It was. Uh -huh. It was. It was published in 1976, mm -hmm. and it was at a conference. So imagine the, the, the set. The set. The scene that we would set would be, you know, maybe, uh, you know, Sylvia, Sylvia Winter in, in, in an audience. In, you know, giving this talk in an audience, including whoever. You know, Jerome Rothenberg or, or you know, the whole ethnopoetics crowd. The whole yeah. crowd in sort of contemporary, you know, or let's say post-World War II experimental American poetry. I think Glissant was there too. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's this amazing document, mm -hmm. but it's a document and it's a document of, I think it's a document that is essentially calling for precisely, well, calling for something very much like the work that you just described. Mm -hmm. okay. And and it and it plays itself out on a couple of different levels because on the one hand, there's this sense that it's absolutely crucial and important to first of all recognize what is now being quickly relegated under the rubric uh, to, in, into the realm of the ethnopoetic, 
to recognize that the ethnopoetic has formal problems, okay? mm -hmm. that it's constantly making a set of formal interventions and formal innovations that are not simply meant to suggest that this is our own brand of conceptuality, let's say, mm -hmm. that that could be seen as against going against the grain of a certain kind of European conceptuality, but rather mm -hmm. that here is a way to imagine, let's say, a more general understanding of, con of conceptuality as a part of, but not as necessarily the dominant part, okay, mm -hmm. of a more general sort of, let's say, of a kind of intellectual comportment in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that intellectual comportment in the world, in a certain sense, is already signaled by just the idea of a book of counsel, or a book of community, or a book of the people, right? As Popo who is, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is it, what's it, how do we begin to, to continue to push for the idea of new formal innovations, of new kinds of theoretical practices that are at the same time not predicated on the specific modes of individuated, separable conceptuality, right? Mm. That mm. that you know that are that are that sort of seem to be part and parcel of the colonial attitude. Right? Yeah, yeah. It, one way to think about it, I suppose, would be: here's this is just another modality of the ways in which we've been always training ourselves to think about what the relationship is between the pre-colonial and the anti-colonial. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, when the when the individual that ends at the limits of the skin is born, mm. uh, 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 rather than the individual that is individual, right? That yeah. is, like, uh, yeah. uh, or something like that. Yeah, that is um, a fantastic question uh, and a very difficult one. Um, and I I would not say that I you know my work. Um, <laughs> answers it because it's 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 a constant negotiation uh um, um between form and content mm -hmm. i think um just in a very practical way a very practical sense is uh how are you dealing with your object of inquiry are you engaging it at the level of content or are you properly engaging it at the level of form um mm -hmm. and i think that uh, and you know, I, I respect that you know, so many of the ethnopoetic people, you know, I, are, are like have been helpful for me, uh, have you know, have brought me into uh, um, uh, into into the discourse even. Um, uh, but I feel like a big formal problem was that they only had one form, uh, and they had a lot of content. Right? Mm -hmm. They had a lot of content that they were processing through th something like um, um, deterritorialization. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, never taking seriously the uh, uh, intellectual impact that thinking more carefully through the indigenous, minoritized, subalternized, marginalized form would have imposed upon them. Right mm -hmm. to 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 think less um, 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 uh, authoritatively as authors, authors with a you know capital singularized you know, um, uh, disciplinary formation uh, as authors translating these works of you know, indigenous, first world, aboriginal uh, poetry. Um, I think that that's what I feel Sylvia mm -hmm. Winter is getting at, is mm -hmm. that when you um, uh, focus in on the form, you bring out the social, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because the, the, the you know, and, and you bring out exactly that form of social, sociality of, mm -hmm. of, of the making of the socios that you're talking about that doesn't end at the limits of one's individual skin um, or you know one's like individual identity as um, uh, uh, what do you, as, 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 um, as the scholar or something mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, who writes books with you know the, the name uh, attached uh, yeah. to them. So that's why uh, uh, <laughs> skins of Columbus to me, uh, what is is about um, dreams in a non Freudian sense. That's why I articulate it in that way. That's why I describe it in that way uh, mm -hmm. because I want the uh, dream space to be um, understood. The dream space of that book or the dream space as I'm trying to experience it as a a, 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 a place of absolute diffusion. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. um, uh, rather than something like an, um, 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 an, 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 an index for non-permeability. Mm -hmm. um, and in the Science of the Americas book, for me, there was one moment where I felt I did it, I did that in a very explicit way, which was in the dedication. Um, I don't know if you got that, it comes real quick, it's right at the beginning, uh, but I dedicate that book uh, to the ancestors, yeah. um, to the ancestors crowding the room, yes. uh, because I feel that there is, you know, like they're here, they're in us, okay. they're in you know, all that history is, is, is like, is, is bringing this conversation that I'm giving to you now into being, and sometimes I, you know, it's not, it's not me. It's, yeah. it's, it's a whole history, a whole world. It's, it's, a, it's a plurality of, of, of voices. I think Winter's into this. She, she really is attuned to the way that the very idea of ethnos has this deadening effect, okay, on <laughs> what it is that is supposedly illuminated when that <laughs> term is applied. Mm -hmm. So that so that for the ethnopoetics folks, you know, try as they might, be precisely because, as you say, they don't attend to the living form, mm -hmm. okay, of the content that they have discovered. Mm -hmm. They imagine themselves as breathing life into dead content. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, that's it. that's it. And but the but the but the fact of the matter is is that the content is is really a content that is always structured by this continual process of forming of informing of afforming of deforming yeah. right because it's a lot because it's still being it's still being lived it's still being worked and they didn't they couldn't quite it's an interesting problem too right because it's the it's problem a, yeah. it's it's like the aesthetic concern right that would manifest itself in relation to something that would show up as a work of art, right? Where, where the work of art is almost of necessity by very definition, detached on some level from a kind of breath, right? Even, even for the poets that we love, right? That, that fetishization of the work is always a, is, it always bears a kind of deanimation to it. And mm -hmm. that deanimation is interesting because it, it actually leads the ethnopoetics folks in a way away from some kind of awareness of ongoing life or existence that the anthropologists and the ethnographers as fucked up and problematic as they are still have that, right? <laughs> right, this is, so, the, so, the, so that the difference maybe between Olson on the one hand and, 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 and Malinowski Right. One of the differences is that what you get in Malinowski is this very, very brutal fact, this very, very brutal residue of his having to contend with the fact of people who are living. Right. <laughs> it, it's ugly it's the a, way he does it. Right. Yeah. But it's real that he has to do it. Right. In it's a source kind of, of deep way. anxiety for him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he, and, and meanwhile, what you're doing is like this whole other. That was a tangent because that's because what I really wanted to do in the wake of you invoking your dedication. I hope you don't mind. I, I, I hope you're not one of the kind of poets who doesn't like other people reading their poems out loud, right? Because can, no. can I read? Okay, okay. Because this is from this is on page this is on page forty four of Skins of Columbus, and to my mind, in a way, I think it it, it goes with the dedication. Um, mm. It's from Saturday. Um, Saturday through Wednesday, November 28th. Um, and just a quick note, those two days are the, the, the day when November 28th fell on 1492 is yeah. Saturday, and Wednesday is the day when November 28th fell on 2015 when I wrote the book. And, and that beautiful mark, that, <laughs> that beautiful wave, that wave function mark almost, right? It, it's always marking that offset. Right, that 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 offset between not just between historical moments, but but even could indicate an offset between calendars, right? Between yeah, whole yeah. different modalities of marking time. You know, yeah. it is. It's a little tiny dialectical image. Yeah. It's a little it's, tiny pictograph. Yeah. It, it, 
here's this poem. It's a, I am in my grandmother's tiny room in her tiny concrete house outside San Salvador. So close to the fields, I smell wet earth past the village trash. Composite realities. Strangely, while I am dreaming, I also have deja vu. And we are sitting again on her bed for she is dead and alive too. Her bedside cabinet, as usual, peopled with icons and saints perched next to each other, sitting on top of one another, stuck with tape to the wall too, beneath other ones stuck to. Stuck to some of their bodies are the more familiar faces of her kin, sister, children, ancient friends. It seems very normal to live in collage, her scrapping together in the teal tin roofed room. It seems very normal to live in collage, you know. Um, and anyway, that 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 feels to me like that resonates so much with your dedication and what you were just saying about that they're here, they're here. Yeah. It, it reminds me of that amazing, beautiful poem by Etheridge Knight, you know, in Praise of Ancestry, where where he's living in and with the collage of his of the forty seven people in his family that he has taped whose pictures he has taped to the walls of his cell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I feel temporal overlap in it, any moment of love, anxiety, uh, astonishment, um, uh, fear, um, um, uh, anger, right? Yeah. Anger at colonial history. That to me is the, the temporal, temporal overlap of living in collage, living with your history crowding the room um, yeah. and exactly it, you hit it you hit it man um and your reading was beautiful thank you um uh and that's what i mean when i say you know i, I don't just speak for myself and it's not to say that you know, i'm oracular or anything I'm, I'm just saying that this history is not just me um and i i hope the work that i'm doing is an honor and a justice to that um um, um uh, to those many many people you know one night i sat up or i laid in bed not during the columbus but just a, as a kind of thought experiment and thought about how with every generation your ancestor pool doubles right uh -huh. and if you think just like like 10 steps back that's a shit ton of people mm -hmm. and then you go back 10 more and that's just and it just doubles and doubles and doubles and doubles and soon you have to you, you come to realize that any kind of possible human that there could have been a social character is a part of you right? from the you know yeah. greatest and most gracious to the worst and the most depraved like yeah. um yeah. swirling uh, uh, um yeah um it's, it's <laughs> like it's like you know the the narrow you know uh the narrow frame of a kind of individualized ethics is just mm. obliterated, you know, by the mathematical sublime, <laughs> you know, it's, like, <laughs> right. it's blown yeah. out, you know, and, and it, yeah. yeah. You know, but the, um, the ethics thing is really important because the Popo Vuh, so, you know, for a long time, um, um, anthropologists and people who work in ethnological domains, let's call it, uh, have resisted the idea that non-Western cultures have philosophy. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, 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 a phrase, there's a somewhat famous, maybe you've heard it. Uh, some say Heidegger said it, some say Husserl said it, who the fuck cares? Mm -hmm. It was one of those guys said it, which is that um, uh, Western philosophy is tautology, non-Western philosophy is oxymoron, right? Um, that is, <laughs> you know, uh, there can be no conceptuality from yeah. non-Western. Now, of course, I'm absolutely against that. Uh, but now, uh, you know, like post, let's say, Levi Strauss uh, and his idea that, you know, like, um, um, uh, uh, cultural systems have structural feel, uh, uh, features that can be understood as something like theory bearing, concept bearing. Now, now there's a little bit more leeway there, but there's still a strong resistance. So like indigenous peoples have worldview, but there's still this huge strong resistance to the idea that they have ethics. Mm -hmm. That's that's still like a like a huge sticking point for philosophers that there can be ethics 
in non-Western um, uh, you know, philosophical uh, systems. And the Popo Vu, and this is something I talk about in this new book too, Emergency, is full of ethics. Right? It's, it's about the ethics of greed or, or non-greed, I should say, the, the problems with you know, rapaciousness with, with greed. Um, it's, it's about the ethics of around pride. Um, and it's uh, also about the, um, geez, I, I lost my train of thought. It was something about, um, something I wanna say about ethics. But anyways, it's 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 um, it's well, it's got it, it's got ethics to it too. I yeah. mean, the the thing about it is, it's like you know, if if you were ever in, caught up in a situation in which you decided that it was necessary to prove mm -hmm. that there was a kind of that there is non-Western philosophy, uh, or mm -hmm. let's say let you know, or, 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 or ethics, let, 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 let's say you, you decide, okay, well, it's necessary to demonstrate that this is so. Mm -hmm. And you go ahead and do so, you demonstrate that it is so. It, it's, it's perfectly possible to, to offer such a demonstration. Then the real problem becomes, then the real problem emerges, right? Because you have to, because, because it turns out that because you'd have to, because at that point you have to ask the question concerning the desirability of ethics and philosophy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> what, 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 why would we have wanted such things in the first place? What does it mean to have had such things? What, uh, what comfort? What's, yeah. What, what's the relationship between a certain capacity for ethics and philosophy and, and conceptuality, yeah. and 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 a, and, a, and, a, and and the capacity for brutality? Mm -hmm. No, yeah. these are, and, and these are, this is a, it's, it's important to have acknowledged the mm -hmm. capacity, right? Those, the generality of those capacities, mm -hmm. because, because that then allows you to avoid falling into the trap of saying, oh, well, our, our, you know, our shit is pure because we didn't have that nasty stuff. No, mm -hmm. no, no, no. We had it. And guess what? The fact that we had it explains a lot. Okay. Mm -hmm. It explains the entire range of the history of brutalities that we can't, in the first instance, attribute to to so-called Western man, right? <laughs> um, but 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 given that we now live in the era of that particular brutality, right? Which and it's an era that appears to only have an end if the world itself comes to a damn end. But given that we are in this moment now, okay, this raises the question of okay, a general criticism, okay. <laughs> And we could even say a general and generally loving and militant criticism, okay, that we would have to direct towards, you know, conceptuality as such, towards the philosophical as such, which turn towards the ethical in the ways that we have come to understand it. Because mm -hmm. these things are problems, right? They, they, it's like, a, to me, this is like an Octavia Butler quote, <laughs> you know, these are, these are, what if it turns out that these, that 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 the tendency towards domination that all of these elements are bound up with indicate a flaw mm -hmm. that we got to deal with, you know, rather than simply the the self evidence of our of 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 our absolute value. You know, I, I remembered the point that I was dry, like building up towards, which I think um, helps to respond to the question of ethics and absolute value, ethics and uh, politics of uh, brutal exclusion, of uh, mm -hmm. uh, excluding brutalization. Uh, and it was <laughs> how the Popo Vu has a very distinct sense of action that doesn't bifurcate. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, we, we have a sense of action that and, and it comes from classical antiquity, upon which so much of our philosophical ethical thinking is based. Where uh, 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 the action of a hero at one moment in time splits time for all time, and you're set down one path that ends in the Trojan War, mm -hmm. uh, um, something like that. It's like it's this it's this um, um, sense of action that. Um, um, uh, culminates in brutality, and there's no fixing or resolving it because it's um, absolute, um, uh, in a sense, as you're saying. The, the Popovu doesn't work that way. It um, has this weird structure that is um, 
highly recursive in which its heroes return time and again to the scene of original action and they get multiple attempts to try it again right mm -hmm. and that's what i mean when i'm saying um that the the uh, uh ethics and the ethics of the popo vu enable something like non-absolutist sense non-absolutist mm -hmm. understandings of uh, decision, action, comport. Um, mm -hmm. it, it enables revisability, revision, revisitation. Um, uh, and these are all just like, you know, like um, um, reflections on the yeah. way in which I have come to process the Popo Vu as a, 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 a book to think with. It's like, it's like you could imagine two possible variations, right? You could say it's the quantum ethics of the Popo Vu <laughs> or the yeah. jazz or the jazz ethics of the Popo Vu. Oh, huh. Right? Because because yeah. first of all, that it's that that the that the differentiation that occurs as a function of action uh -huh. is a differentiation, but not a separation. Right. That's right. That, that's that's a, a that's a that's a that's a Denise de Silva formulation. It's a it's a differentiation in time uh -huh. and history. But not a separation, and That's it produces, so nice. and it produces a kind of recursivity, and that, yeah. and, and we could speak of that recursivity in terms of like it's like what what Karen Barad would call intraactive. It's an intraactive uh -huh. recursivity that makes that 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 does not eliminate, okay, yeah. in some absolutist way the alternative. It's this yeah. constant preservation of the alternative, right? Yeah, as 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 a as an actual force. Right, mm -hmm. and then, and then, and then, or in the jazz sense of it, it would just be yeah that 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 the, that the soloist constant recursive relation to theme. Mm -hmm. Actually, me, <laughs> me and my my our our el, our youngest son is playing piano now and is right and is making compositions, and that's what we were talking about last night. Nice. We listened nice. to we listened to three different versions. Of the old standard, I'll get by. So we listened to like a, a a Frank Sinatra version of it, and then Billie Holiday's version of it, and then a Sun Ra version of it. You know, Whoa. And, yeah. and really, and really, what it what it was really about were the and what what we noticed with regard to the Sun Ra especially was that he was constantly maintaining a relation to that melody, right? Mm. Wouldn't mm. let the melody go. He was, mm. he was very monk-like in the way that he was playing. Mm. He wouldn't mm. let the melody go. Mm. And yet, and so every time, every there's a there's a there's a very specific kind of what I would call a hook in I'll get by. You know, it's like a a kind of a swooping sort of descending, maybe Shakespeare would call it a dying fall, you know, in the middle of that melody. <laughs> do, 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 you know, and there's just that drop. And he would never let that go. He would never let it go. He was constantly coming back to it. And it, and I guess I'm saying maybe that's something like what you're describing with the with the, that recursive sort of movement that the hero makes towards that original scene or towards that scene of action, which of course, if it's truly recursive, there's no question of it being original, is it? It's, it's fucking up yeah. the idea of origin already any fucking way, you know? Right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that for Sun Ra, uh, it's, it's not just that he won't let go, but it won't let go of him. Yeah, right? oh yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. Like, and, and that's, you know, the, precisely the relation that I'm talking about is that, yeah. you know, history won't let go of you. Well, what are you gonna do about that? History <laughs> won't let go of you and the alternative won't let go of you. It won't uh -huh. let go. It won't uh -huh. let go. It won't, you know, this is, yeah, no, no. I, okay, I, I just wanted to come back to two, one thing in, in Signs of the Americas. Um, one thing that I love, I love, um, I love the images, right? And I, and I love that, that, that it is, uh, it's a book about signing and it's a book about writing, which is to say it's a book about these beautiful constant iterations of the mark, okay? Mm. Mm. But what I also love is that there's a kind of intense, brilliant, beautiful poetic sensibility that emerges in your captions for the images, mm. right? Mm. 
And it reminded me almost of those kind of great, like there's this beautiful book by, by Langston Hughes in which he writes captions for the photographs of, of, of this great, great, brilliant photographer named Roy de Carab. The book is called The Sweet Flypaper of Life. <clears throat> and it's like a kind of photographic, poetic essay about life in Harlem, you know, in, mm. the, in the 50s and 60s. And, and the captions are, are poems, you know? Mm. And I feel like your captions are poems. And there's one caption that I love. My favorite caption, actually, is for figure 24. It's on page 168. Um, and I, it, it's Bronislav Malinowski shielded in whiteness amid the potent coloration of the Trobriand Islands, 1929. Quote, talking to Togugwa, a sorcerer of some repute, which is a, a quotation that you've inserted from Malinowski's famous, infamous, great evil book, The Sexual Life of Savages. And I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to see if you would say something about not only the, the poetics of, of the caption, but specifically in relation to, to, to Malinowski's image in this photograph, which is like it's it's so fun, it's so tense. It's, I, it's people yeah. can't see it. It's like I, I don't know if this works holding it up to the camera like that. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's Malinowski in a literal shield of whiteness, the white the, the anthropologists. Um, suit of the 19th, late 19th, early 20th century, which was an all white suit and often with a, a white pith helmet um, uh, that is uh, absolutely um, uh, out of like, like it's the wrong suit to be wearing if you want to keep your outfit clean, right? Yeah. Like in, in, yeah. in the field, let's say, like you're, you're dressed all in white. Um, so there's this like other motivation I feel, or, or I argue in the book uh, for him in that moment, which is to show that he can stay white right? mm. uh, by keeping his outfit white. Um, uh, uh, in spite of the fact that in a way he knows he can't and he's fearful of the fact that he can't and he has a deep anxiety of um, the um, uh, intellectual, uh, social, um, cultural forms that he's setting out to die. He has this deep fear that they will be stronger than he is, that they will um, uh, introduce into his world color. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, Malinowski yeah. is ter terrified of color. If you read his diaries, uh, diary in a strict sense, mm -hmm. um, uh, which were unpublished and secret for a long time, and I think they got published in the 70s and they created this huge... Um, scandal in anthropology because of how well, racist they are, yeah. uh, but also weirdly how um, obsessed with color, like just chromatism he is in those mm -hmm. diaries. Mm -hmm. uh, you can tell that it's just like, it's this, it's this double entanglement of fear and desire, of um, love and anxiety, of, you know, like, of, of, of all the emotions that the social formation of whiteness sets itself up mm -hmm. to have to be troubled by. <laughs> like it, so, so that's why I say shielded in whiteness. I say Malinowski shielded in whiteness, obviously shielded in white garb, but also yeah. if you just look at his posture, oh, he's, yeah. positioning, he, he's positioning himself in whiteness, you know, like, like in the social formation of whiteness with all that, privilege and power which only reflects chinks in the armor yeah it's like it's it's, it's, a, it's a sign of weakness it's, it's the ramrod the ramrod upright aggressive three-dimensionality yeah. that he's trying to carry off in that pose yeah right? with his foot up like that just stomping all over the world man like yeah. up that that uprightness you know yeah. that yeah. that yeah. that 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 kind of, that absolute refusal of anything that we would situate on the level of a kind of contraction, of a contractibility of the body, right? Mm. Like mm. there's no breakdown, there's no get down, so to speak in Malinowski in that image. And what's interesting is what the relationship is between that 
that that kind of psychotic, you know, desire for to project an impossible purity, right? Mm -hmm. it, it reminds me of the way of the sort of analytic, the critical analytic of purity that, that, that Nam Chandler offers in, in, in his work. And <laughs> it makes me think that that Nam, you know, kind of working, going through an anthropology department, may, this is also part of what it is that he's getting at. It's part of what, he's got this great essay called Originary Displacement. And in that essay, he's really talking again about, you know, what, what it would mean to disrupt something like what we might call the uprightness of the mm -hmm. of the F, of the of the more generally ethnological project, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And at the same and, time, go, go ahead. Well, and 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 what I was going to say is, at the level of the sign, it comes through in a uh, kind of standard chromaticlasm, yeah. a fear of color in writing. Mm -hmm. That writing itself, the like inscription, needs to be literally black and white, actually black and white, and can't be um, of, of, of any other color, form, means, whatever. Um, uh, it, it's a, it's a it's fear. Cryptography is really troubling for people. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a fear of chromaticism that's also coming about at a moment in which there's this tremendous desire for chromaticism. <laughs> and at the same time, it's coming about at a moment when the battle against chromaticism is 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 being lost, yeah. right? It's 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 not sustainable, you know. It's <laughs> not sustainable in in music. I mean, <laughs> the, the, it's it's not. It's in, in other words, you know, that 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 Western concert music at that same moment is being <laughs> overtaken by chromaticism. And it's and the chromaticism is is then a t and then there's a, a this a tremendous desire to to regulate that chromaticism, okay, to 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 harness it and to regulate it within certain you know already given structures. But 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 once the chromaticism is unleashed, its disruptive force won't go won't can't be put back in the box. Yeah. And 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 that's that's the you know that's the contingency that that upright stance is supposed to somehow militate against it, it can. And, and then if, if you look at the edited, unpublished versions of Malinowski's great books like Coral Reefs and Gardens and um, Sexual Lives of Savage, he actually cuts out, deletes um, mm. descriptions of color in mm. the places where he's at. And, and I don't mean racial color, I mean just like, like flowers and the sky and the oceans. He deletes that stuff intentionally because of, again, this desire to hold, hold it back, hold it in. Um, I, I want to say, I want to return to your question, though, because I answered it in, um, in, in a local way. Uh, but I think you were also asking for a, like, a, like a more conceptual answer, uh, like why the captions done in this way, yeah. um, um, uh, done with something that we might call evocation, that I, that I myself think of as evocation. Mm -hmm. um, and that is because I did not want the pictures in the book to be secondary to the text mm -hmm. or subordinated to the text or illustrative of the text. I wanted them to be a part of the conceptual framework that I was describing for pictures through pictography, which is of you know, pictures that get thought moving, right? mm -hmm. uh, the, the pictures that elicit conversation. Um, I mean, pictures that get thought moving is Adorno's description of the dialectical image. But as you know, from reading the book, I, I use that idea to help to translate something of uh, what I feel the intellectual um, contours of pictography are and i wanted to do something like that with the pictures in the book um to, to to make them not secondary or subordinate to the text on the page but to make them you know by by, by way of caption or placement or organization or even relation to one another um mm -hmm. as in you know in in in, in which ones i place uh, and in what order um evocative mm -hmm. um, um uh, thought eliciting in their own right, so that's where that, that those that's where my thinking around those kinds of captions comes from. Hey, we're almost out of time, Fred, and I yeah. I want to say since we're almost out of time, and you read one of my poems, I want to read a poem that 
I can't say I wrote for you because I didn't like write it or dedicate it for you, but that your work made possible for me to write. That's the better way to think about it. Uh, uh, um, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a poem written with you, let's say. Um, and it's from my new book of poems, Zaya, which is a creation story for contemporary times, uh, three sections long. Uh, and by contemporary story for uh, uh, creation story for contemporary times, I mean uh, a creation story that begins out of crisis and world collapse. Mm -hmm. um, and it's three sections long, nine cantos each section. Um, uh, um, nine, <laughs> well, I'm thinking about nine stanzas per canto, five lines per stanza, and it's in pentameter. So it's just like, okay. <laughs> uh, it's just like symmetrical work. <clears throat> and this is after the first human has been made. And these are the words spoken by the first human uh, in this creation story. Uh, and it's called the first words, the 12 senses. Um, and, uh, and this is uh, in honor of Fred, your work, uh, but also with Fred and your work. And it's, and it's a way of showing my gratitude, um, uh, not just for you being here today, but in a, in a bigger sense. So I'll end by uh, reading this um, um, poem. You dreaming ears, now calm, now calming yourselves, who had that thought that you were beautiful and that I strove to love you in the high old ways. Let me not wander into a barren dream. Let me not grow into a hollow moon. Unanswerable dread is just as soon a substance more complex than silver suns. And so I speak your passions plain as day, as sharp as that which you call gaiety, a thing appended but estranged from joy. In its false reckoning, this satellite, this shining glass I am, first heard itself, and hearing it heard crash of strangely moving because electrically familiar, the slower bravery of gods and myth. Their odor as hard as mercury made dust of mountains in my speech. This bruiselessness made fires that regulate the flow of terms intact, but lustrous heat importing its burst, that rabid mania of surfaces. Through every question I could hope to see sublunary because economies like those of stones and bodily desire are always loved so long as they back off, as cold to the touch as too much wine or jokes. The monstrousness of externality itself will never bother me much, not now that I have had to settle into this. This spirit outside all knowing that does not speak, that sees perhaps and smells maybe, but seeps like a sponge into its spores, perceptiveness in layers of cells spreading while nervously original, insomniac, a smile, the kind of centaur would shoot across a bar, a braving littleness in which the life you've lived then balances itself, stands clear, and so becomes the door through which to pass. Still also one, your wishing mind obstructs its generosity is like the mold that grows on cream, a gorgeous heat, a love that proves itself as complicated as those nights, those interfering horses of the deep that do not let you sleep. All movement bows, you bow, I bow, in proprioceptive knees, and thus we touch the blindness that touches all of life. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Yes. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. And Fred, man. Let's, Edgar and Fred, thank you all so much. Um, that was tremendous. Um, thank you. Um, 
So I um, uh, hope that um, people can stick around. Um, we'll have our second conversation today um, between Eric Fretwell and Elizabeth Dillon um, starting in 15 minutes at 11.45 West Coast time. Thanks again, you all. So um, welcome back everybody to our second conversation today, um, New Adventures in American Studies um, with um, Erica Fretwell and Elizabeth Dillon um, talking about Erica's great book, um, Sensory Experiments. Uh, great. Thank you um, so much, Brian, for this um, invitation, the opportunity to be here. I'm really honored and excited to be talking with Elizabeth today. Um, and I'm just generally grateful for the opportunity to celebrate Edgar's and Joshua's books as well um, with, with Dylan Rodriguez and Fred Moten, who I'm always learning from. So, um, and I also want to uh, thank um, those who've been working behind the scenes to uh, make this wonderful event happen. So um, while my interlocutor, while Elizabeth um, is acquainted with the book, uh, some, of the, some of those of you in the audience um, might not be. So I'm just going to briefly kind of summarize some sense of your experience. Um, that, you know, basically it offers um, a story about the cultural life of this 19th century science called psychophysics. And, you know, the book is in conversation with affect theory, critical race studies, uh, biopolitical critique, um, and uses psychophysics, this kind of little known um, science of the mind to flesh out the contradictory ways that feeling was thought um, in the late 19th century US. Um, so placing both professional and more, you know, vernacular quote unquote um, science in conversation with the aesthetic experimentation of writers and cultural producers um, from William Mumler and his spirit photography and Abby Fisher, a formerly enslaved woman who um, authored a cookbook up through Helen Keller and Dickinson and, and James Weldon Johnson. And so um, with regards to uh, today's symposium, um, you know, and thinking about American studies broadly in the field itself, you know, I, I, I think of the book as this project that tries to rethink or or thicken at least, um, a question that has been fundamental um, to the field, which is how does it feel to be a problem? Um, the kind of opening salvo um, of Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk. And it's, you know, it's one of the most canonical scenes in American literature and culture and, and the field itself. And, you know, I think in part because it's, I mean, what I kind of love about the question, there, there are a number of things, but it's a question with, no speaking subject. Like it's a question that does not need to be uttered or posed to Du Bois because it's already been internalized or if not internalized, then we might say it's atmospheric. It's sort of this hanging in the air between, um, you know, quote me and the other world, um, the black self and the, and the white supremacist nation. And so Du Bois's narration of that question frames the you know, feeling of being a problem um, kind of less as an actual utterance than, than uh, the, the web uh, in which in which black life is lived, but as you know, familiar as that scene is um, to us, um, I, I think it still retains the capacity to surprise. Uh, and so, you know, Du Bois's response to that question, we we also know, which is you know the the strange sensation of double consciousness. I think invites us to read that feel of being a problem, not simply idiomatically, but uh, literally too, right? As a as a perception or texture. And so then that sort of generates further questions like how does this sensorium become racially specific? Um, why describe racialization in sensory terms? And the answer to those questions I think is implicit in the text. Um, when Du Bois describes double consciousness as a strange sensation, he then elaborates by describing it as the feeling of having one's soul measured by the tape of another world. And so, you know, my my first readings, and I think many, you know, other other literary cultural critics as well, you know, we might be wont to gloss over this phrase, um, which um, seems to have more of a rhetorical purpose than anything else, is a kind of poetic um, uh, flourish or uh, sort of poetic moment on Du Bois's part, an almost kind of Dickinsonian juxtaposition of the abstract and the concrete of the soul and, and measuring tape. Um, and it's a beautiful phrase, but uh, it's also um, more than that too, or its beauty derives um, from, from other sources as well. Um, and it's, 
a direct, if obliquely stated, reference to psychophysics, which was a science that purported to measure the soul um, by, by testing people's responses to sensory um, stimuli. So once I had realized that uh, Du Bois's meditation on the lived experience of the color line uh, was a fundamentally psychophysical formulation, this then opened up more questions. Um, you know, how is belonging or belonging to social more broadly, not simply learned, but lived and embodied, you know, what systems of value, epistemological, aesthetic, affective, um, the value of life, um, you know, what systems of value do psychophysical models of feeling underwrite? Um, and how might attention to the, the sensory life of external power structures illuminate the, the kind of traffic between you know, disciplinary subject position um, on the one hand and the perhaps more kind of phenomenological uh, subjectivity on the, on the other. And so, you know, this, the questions kind of congeal around this, this thorny knot of affect and aesthetics and power. And my book tries to answer them by telling a story about this, the sensory configuration of social life in the late 19th century United States or post bellum uh, more broadly. And, um, and so that involves psychophysics. And so just for those who might not be acquainted with the science, um, I'll just give a very brief uh, thumbnail sketch. Um, so psychophysics was the first experimental science of mind. It was developed in Germany, um, mid 19th century Germany um, by uh, the likes of Gustav Fechner and Hermann von Helmholtz. Um, and it sat at the nexus of philosophy and physiology kind of crisscrossing empiricism and metaphysics and aesthetics. And it did this um, by using laboratory methods to answer the philosophical mind-body problem. And the hope was that by quantifying people's sensory experiences, right, by attaching numbers um, to sensory experiences, that that would empirically prove this monistic theory of nature that body and soul, matter and mind are two sides of the same ontological coin. And so I just wanna underscore two central concepts to how you know, I understand psychophysics functioning um, in the United States at this moment. Uh, the first main concept is this idea of perceptual sensitivity, which is this um, like discerning small gradations of sensation, like catching a whiff of perfume. Um, that's understood um, as this kind of affective substrate of aesthetic judgment. And then the other concept is this idea that sensory experiences are representations of the world, that they're not reflections of the object world, that's Locke, but representations of the world, um, that our, our perceptions are signs that originate in the body, originate in physical sensation, but then through experience acquire symbolic meanings that help us navigate our environment. And so a major part of the book is this archival unearthing. Um, and um, I mean, that. We can also talk more about uh, that that kind of recovery, and I mean Edgar's recovery is phenomenal, um, and uh, so I'm thinking as well about archival issues and questions. But so uh, you know, our, there's an archival recovery at the heart of that, which is you know recovering um, the science of psychophysics itself, like the books written by Fechner and Helmholtz, but also locating the filtration of psychophysical ideas and vocabularies through non-expert writing in the US in periodicals mainly, like Living Cots or Harper's Monthly, um, which is how science was communicated to the public at the time. And you know, in these materials, um, you know, psychophysics does not announce itself as such. Um, in the American um, periodical archive, it is rarely named, but exists in a, speci in a specific vocabulary, like waves, thresholds, just noticeable differences. And, you know, I, I think back to you boys as well, like it's sort of in the air in the postbellum period. And so my own research experience kind of reproduced the, oh, that obliqueness. Um, I sort of circled around the phenomenon. Um, you know, I, I was certainly around this phenomenon that it took me a while to like locate and identify. Um, I was noticing patterns like like linguistic patterns, like particular words, but um, it didn't it took me a while to even know that there was a reason for why that pattern had emerged. Um, and then I realized it was psychophysics. So the books, um, the general argument is that psychophysics transformed ideas about sensation and that um, in turn, American writers adapted these ideas. 
um, to pressure uh, the biological models of human difference, you know, underwriting the social order, but also to articulate the affective, um, though no less material reality um, of, of racial and social difference. So, you know, here the senses are kind of the hinge upon which science and aesthetics pivot. Um, the domain of literature then sort of operates, you know, not simply um, to reflect scientific ideas, but it's a site where psychophysics is manipulated and adapted and done so um, in the service of answering um, like an adjacent question. So like the question for say Helmholtz was, you know, in his laboratory, like how does it feel to hear a hum or a whisper? Um, and we hear echoes of that in, for instance, Pauline Hopkins's um, genre defying novel of one blood which asks um you know how does it feel for a you know quote tra tragic mulata like dianthe lusk to hear the you know minor cadence of her grandmother's voice of black uh, matrilineage so you know then what kind of emerges is this this project that i call psychophysical aesthesis aesthesis being the the etymological seat of aesthetics um referring to sensation uh, you know, where psychophysics reads sensation as a mental sign, psychophysical aesthesis, which we sort of see with Hawkins is, you know, it formalizes the signifying power of sensory experience. It, it transfers, like in the case of Hawkins, the kind of universalist mind matter relation that's posited by the science to the more culturally specific domain of the self social world uh, relation. And then that, ends up sort of transforming the senses from signs into more kind of expansive um, lived genres or embodied conventions in the kind of Lauren Berlant sense, um, you know, for mediating the, the vicissitudes of, of being and belonging in this world. Um, so just sort of like pan out a bit, uh, situate with the book within the field. I think then, you know, some of the, the payoffs I would hope for the book um, is in apprehending how the history of science helps us rethink, you know, our distinct but entwined uh, genealogies of affect and aesthetics, uh, or perhaps more precisely in recognizing the elemental centrality of race and racialization to those genealogies. So I see, for instance, sensory experiments as, as joining other um, projects, most recently, um, like Kyla Schuler's Biopolitics of Feeling or Britt Russert's Fugitive Science, you know, that make the history of science and feminist uh, science studies central to the analysis of aesthetics and power. And I think this history adds texture to the revitalized interest in aesthetics that has been holding um, for a, a couple of decades now, that kind of revaluation that sort of happened at the turn of the, the 21st century um, in criticism. Like for instance, Elizabeth's uh, important scholarship from sentimental aesthetics to New World as thesis, um, defined as a community of taste or census communist, um, which is typically read as disembodied kind of top-down Kantian relation, you know, instead as a full-bodied relation to the world, um, not despite, but because it unfolds in the teeth of settler colonialism and empire. Um, and, you know, thinking of, you know, Candace Chu uh, likewise makes a, a powerful case for reactivating aesthetics by turning back to Aristotelian uh, census communists in, in the service of articulating um, alternatives to liberal humanism. So, so as part of that conversation, um, you know, the book, I think, you know, I try to re-describe the constitution of aesthetics via psychophysics as a practice, you know, crisscrossing the literary and scientific realms. And so it tracks, you know, the theoretical and the practical remaking of the science of the senses as aesthetics. Uh, so there's a, there's a certain kind of like redundancy or what it appears like a redundancy at the heart of the project, um, which is that the senses are aesthetic. Um, that's because our received account of aesthetics is that, you know, when it was developed in the 18th century in Europe, you know, as this science of sensitive knowing, you know, physical sensation is either extracted from finer feeling or is reduced to a, a springboard for loftier reflection. And, um, you know, Fechner in particular was keyed to that and used his own scientific experiments to develop what he called aesthetics from below, um, redefining beauty, not on moral ideals, but on sensory responses to art, like surveying people in museums. Um, 
and you know, it's tempting to see Fechner's aesthetics from below as this kind of alternative aesthetics that that Chu, for instance, um, sketches out. But you know, I think that my book shows at least that this particular aesthetics from below, um, once it migrates to the U.S., um, is is not as liberatory as we might hope. Um, if we think about, you know, for psycho under psychophysics, sensitivity is this kind of mechanism for the distribution of affective capacities across populations, right? It sort of like makes race a matter of affective regulation at the, at the level of judgment, um, which is to say that psychophysics kind of doubles as aesthetics. It's, it's a system of value used to differentially accord value to particular lives. So this scientific history, I think, sort of makes explicit what has long been implicit in aesthetics, which is that it's not simply, you know, the science of sensitive knowing, but specifically the racial science of sensitive knowing. Um, and to that end, you know, this kind of sensory or embodied aesthetics, uh, aesthetics from below, always kind of, you know, it threatens to collapse into a kind of racial science um, from above or, or more broadly get folded back into biopolitics. It, it always has that potential, doesn't necessarily follow through on that. But I think that we could understand the book as kind of a case study on the ways in which, you know, that there, there's always that kind of tension. Um, and then finally, just to sort of round things out, um, my, my concern has, has been mainly to, to be contemporary minded yet historically responsible when it comes to deepening our understandings of the categories of feeling um, that affect studies theorizes and of historicizing the field itself. Um, you know, because in the in the post-humanist strain of affect studies, um, that, you know, that that developed at least partly from psychology and neuroscience. Um, and so then affect is kind of understood as this system of relations put it as feeling. And so, you know, bodily autonomic processes are like irreducible to the individual or to the human. And that takes precedence over signification in that account. But then there's the Americanist genealogy of affect in which I was initially raised, um, the sort of Jane Tompkins to Lauren Berlant trajectory in which, you know, the category of the human is central. Um, you know, sentimentality, the, the sentimentality ilk of affect studies, you know, it was always a political project because it was grounded in feminist recovery, right? You have both the recovery and evaluation of women's writing that was, had been considered, you know, too invested in love and pain and tears uh, for the canon. But then at the same time, it was also, you know, a study, it produced studies of how that representation of feeling attaches, attaches differently to people across categories of race and gender and class. And that, you know, ends up reinforcing structures of subordination. So, you know, sensory experiments understand science history as a way to, I think, I try to suture these two kind of conceptual strains. Um, you know, psychophysics is on the one hand part of that kind of Spinozan tradition we kind of associate with Masumi, describing affect as relational and intersubjective. Um, yet the almost immediate folding of psychophysical concepts into biopolitical discipline in the 19th century, I think, underscores that the post humanist language of intensities and waves and thresholds is not a historical. Um, some of its roots lay in the entirely liberal humanist project of psychophysics. So this kind of thicker genealogy, I think, invites us to reconsider the mind-body relation as not a strictly philosophical problem, but a mode of biopolitical differentiation as well. Um, and I think it also invites us to reconsider the racial history at the heart of our theorizations of affect. Um, you know, the human never left. So um, just to sort of wrap up, I think, you know, psychophysics shows us that racialization happens, you know, not only through law or social structures or even the body itself, um, you know, heredity or, you know, Foucauldian hygiene discourse. But in addition, also at the pre-conscious level of affect and sensation. Um, Yet at the same time, I want to underscore that there's this countervailing force in the domain of sensation, that this science of affect offers more than an account, um, more than a disciplinary account of feeling as a racializing assemblage. That's part of the story, but the other part of the story is the idea of sensory experience as a flexible sign, fundamentally creative and experimental activity, speculative, you know, not speculative in terms of abstraction, but subjunctive, ongoing, contingent. Um, 
And it's that symbolic activity that, that speculation that's embedded in sensory experience that opens up moments of judgment or contemplation where something else might happen, right? A kind of um, interval of perception that makes something other than an encounter with biopower possible. Um, so to that end, I think, you know, um, one of the payoffs crops of like viewing this historical period's literary and culture production through this science of sensory experience is that it reveals um, a notable reconsideration of lived sensation as fundamentally literary. It kind of circumnavigates the facile language experience um, binary um, and instead installs this idea that a kind of embodied symbolic um, actually brings us closer to the affective um, phenomenal intensity of our of our social environment, which then sort of brings us back to Du Bois in some way. So anyway, that seems like it's been a note um, to end on. And I think uh, <laughs> we've already heard enough from me already. So I was sort of interested in hearing what Elizabeth says um, and get the conversation started. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Uh, and um, I'll just join in, um, in, in thanking Brian um, and uh, uh, Megan, who's working vaccines, and also um, uh, the other uh, people on the panel, Fred, Edgar, Dylan, Joshua, thrilled to be in this, um, uh, in this company. Um, so, so Erica, let me just like begin by congratulating you on an amazing book. Um, the uh, uh, the the my kind of initial um, sense of reading this <laughs> is that there's so much in this book. Um, there's just uh, there's just an enormous amount of um, uh, of of thinking and bringing together um, across disparate fields, um, careful reading, um, archival work, um, and uh, putting things in in new frameworks for us. So. Um, it's it's really extraordinary. So um, so thank you for uh, for doing this work. Um, the, some of the things I want to touch on, you've touched on, um, but but maybe I'll um, kind of bring out some aspects of them with uh, with the th with these um, thoughts or questions. The the I, I wanted to. So I'm interested in this category of psychophysics, right? Um, so you you know you you've structured the book around a kind of um, discarded science, right? <laughs> so a science that you know kind of briefly had its moment and then went away, right? Um, which is like a, um, so so the, so one question is is why, right? Um, and, and and why in the sense of what does that what does that give us, right? What does what does that kind of um, move towards something that had purchase at one time, but we understand it as no longer having purchase? Or actually, you're suggesting that it does, but but in 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 a kind of vernacular sense, it hasn't. I never heard of psychophysics before I read this, and in fact, every time I tried to write it down, I couldn't remember the second half of it when I was halfway through, which is just um, you know. A, 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 an index of how foreign it is, but it's also an index, I think, of the really important work that the that this framework, that this sort of alt science is doing, um, which is, I, I think, like at a very fundamental level, what psychophysics is doing, and is maybe doing for you, and you can tell me if you agree or not, is like messing with our categories, right? Yeah. Um, and, and it's in that sense of messing with our categories that it becomes so valuable. Um, and the, um, uh, so on the one hand, it's, it's, it's articulating a set of categories, but it, because it's a set of categories that are no longer, um, some of which are no longer widely uh, un understood as germane, it also um, uh, messes with some of the ways that we want to divide up the world into, particularly into categories of knowledge. Um, and, uh, and so that's one of the things that I found most, um, you know, most valuable and most intriguing about it. But I don't know, do, do you wanna start there and say like, what is psychophysics doing for you? What is it doing for us? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a, 
that's, that's a really good question. So I, I mean, in some ways, I my my gut response is to actually say that you you sort of answered it already. I mean, I think part of what it does is mess with those categories, and that it's important for us to realize to sort of inhabit the kind of like epistemological chaos of the past in a certain sense. Um, and I think it, I mean, what, I guess most immediately what it does is I think reorganize how we understand the, the sort of received um, Foucauldian account of the discipline of the body in the 19th century and sort of grasping that it's not just the body at a kind of molar level, but it gets like radically molecular, um, where it's you know it's 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 so inward as to be sort of inhabiting consciousness itself. So I think on one hand I want to sort of I think that psychophysics offers a fuller picture of how that plays out, um, but precisely because psychophysics also is not you know it's not a positive a positivist science. It is also a very kind of romanticist theory of life and nature. Um, and so because of that, I think it, you know, in some ways one could narrate psychophysics through like the history of the university, if you want to think about how it messes with our categories and knowledge production, because, you know, as, as I sort of talk about in the book, it it wasn't even a discipline. Um, it, you know, there was no psychophysics department, which I think is part of why we don't know it, right? I mean, how much of what we know about particular fields of knowledge depends on what has been authorized by and in the modern research university. So, you know, these are all people doing psychophysical research that were in different departments. Um, and so in a certain way, I think there's a kind of like infrastructural <laughs> kind of, um, not determinism, but maybe a certain kind of infrastructural determinism when things aren't sort of, um, as we as we know today, when things are not funded or recognized, um, and it's you know um, in a certain way, they they fall at a risk falling out. And so, precisely because it was kind of bridging um, different kind of methodologies and domains of knowledge, you know, right before the kind of that that German research university model really. Um, ultimately defined the university as we know it and got, you know, imported or exported to the U.S. precisely because it, it sort of inhabit, inhabits this kind of moment right before that. Um, I think it sort of bears out the ways in which how we understand, like the configuration of the human in this moment um, is, you know, uh, gets on the one hand uh, sort of narrated at this kind of micro conscious level, right? But also always in a way that is not reducible to those processes of racialization and discipline. There's always that kind of philosophical, what you might call a kind of philosophical excess, but is also the philosophical foundation, right? Of this theory of the human, of this idea of the human um, that is, you know, it's sort of irreducible to that kind of discipline and always kind of opening outwards onto the symbolic. Um, and I think precisely because psychophysics um, was as interested in what people called ontological whimsy and, you know, um, more kind of metaphysical concerns that it, that it ultimately fell out because it didn't fall neatly into the categories that we have um, inherited. And so I guess part of, you know, just to sort of round out um, and just sort of thinking with you and, and thinking about your question. I mean, it gives us, I think, both a historically specific account of what the feeling body looks like and how it was produced in this moment. But I think more broadly, what we also get out of looking at this very short-lived science was is an understanding of how our own received ideas about what affect, what science, what aesthetics is can be. I mean, I don't, I don't want to frame psychophysics as some sort of originary, you know, uh, science out of which all of our vocabulary is emerged by no stretch, but that it, you know, I think it helps explain, you know, the language and vocabulary that we have developed today. Um, and it's important to sort of contextualize how that emerged and how that emerges, you know, in the teeth of empire and racial, you know, racialization and all that. And that, 
effectively the racial racialized body becomes something like you know is a fact of consciousness you know consciousness doesn't get produced and then racialization or kind of embodied differences then get layered onto consciousness but we have to understand that racialization is kind of like the bedrock ultimately i think of how consciousness and feeling kind of get understood and, and theorized so I think that's sort of where I'm thinking about, you know, I think there's different kind of ways to answer that question. I think there's sort of the historical response, but I think also kind of like the broader picture of, you know, uh, being more attuned to the to the history behind the, the vocabulary that we're using today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so one of the, um, one of my favorite things about uh, psychophysics um, is, is the, I can't remember if it's Muller or Fleckner, who um, I think it's Muller, who talks about sensory experience as a sign. Right. Um, so the is that Muller? It was Helmholtz, actually. <laughs> I know. I know. It's just okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, so the um, so this idea that the that sensory experience is not um, is not a kind of unmedi unmediated input if you will, right? Which is kind of what you're, I think you're speaking to with the question of um, racialization. Um, and, and I just wanna, I, I wanna kind of draw a connection back to um, Fred and Edgar's discussion um, around, around the question of form, right? So that, because this is a question of like form as knowledge, the extent to which um, formal structures are, are you talked about infrastructure, that that these formal concepts then uh, are um, uh, they end up constituting what what counts as content and what doesn't count as content. Mm -hmm. So so that's one of the things that I think that this um, that this rethinking categories or thinking through our existing categories in new ways through this history is um, is super valuable. Um, so I wanted I wanted to pick up on um, two. Well, there's a there's a kind of um, fundamental uh, tension, I think, um, that that I really, I, I I really respect the way that you handle it. Um, but I'm interested in um, hearing more about it, and that's that's the question of um, thinking about this work as, um, uh, on the one hand, uh, almost drawing us deeper into. Um, a, a kind of irreducible biopolitics or disciplinarity uh, around the questions of race. So, so you frequently talk about, as you've already mentioned, the extent to which this this kind of um, uh, psychophysics is is almost like um, uh, uh, is is racialization almost taken to a deeper level than than the way we might think of it um, uh, more, you know. Uh, more as a social construct, right? So right. it's different to say, instead of saying it's a social construct, to say that the social construct that is, is, are, is already um, happening at this kind of bodily affective uh, level. But, but, that, but when you say that the, that the um, uh, sensory experience is a sign, um, this also raises this, the question of aesthetics, which again is really, um, um, important, you know, central to the book. And I wanted to, um, so I wanted to ask that, I wanted to touch on the question of the, the census communis versus the um, kind of aesthetics as uh, differentiation, um, mm -hmm. uh, right? So, I, so um, beyond, beyond the fact that I would love to see an aesthesiometer, <laughs> <laughs> It would hurt. It would, you would, you, <laughs> you know the um, uh, so this so aesthesiometer is is a perfect example of um, the way in which aesthetics in psychophysics becomes um, a, a kind of finer and finer mechanism of differentiation, right? Mm -hmm. um, and 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 in that sense, you are explicit about the fact that this is not related to um, uh, census communis, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But then at other times you do go in that direction, right? So, um, so for instance, you talk about um, recipes when you get to the sense of taste yeah. as yeah. a story census communis, right? So 
on the one hand, you have these, these, these structures that sort of take us um, more deeply into kinds of disciplinary racialization. And on the other hand, you, uh, and this is the tension that I'm talking about, yeah. you, um, uh, through your readings, you also show the way in which messing with those categories opens possibilities for someone like Pauline Hopkins um, uh, or um, uh, Emily Dickinson. And so that kind of, um, I keep going like this because there's like a sort of through the looking, like going deeper until you're like suddenly in a very different space. So anyway, I, I wondered if you could talk about that tension both in terms of um, questions of racialization and also questions about um, the, the uh, aesthetics as um, a kind of judgment of, of differentiation and hierarchization versus aesthetics as um, sensing in common. Yeah, that's, yeah, absolutely. So um, it's sort of like a two-part answer, just sort of thinking with you. Um, so to sort of go back to uh, your initial point about, you know, the senses um, as signs, right? So the kind of, like the syllogism there that Helmholtz develops is like relations are real, feeling is relational. So therefore feelings are real things in the world. And this kind of allows us, I think, to register a broader, you know, broader kind of disciplinary formations like race and racialization beyond that, like seemingly intractable, like nature culture binary. Um, where it's, you know, either biological or social, or it's real or a fiction. Um, so I think it, it sort of offers an alternative to that. Um, perceptual reality is this representation of the world and these subjective representations, these sensory experiences are objective facts because they have real effects in the world, right? So double consciousness affects how African-American people see themselves is the case that Du Bois makes, right? How they move through the world relate to others. So the psychophysical model of feeling that kind of that thesis we might say, both then and now kind of um, is helpful for thinking about race as material and materialist without falling into the trap of a kind of strict, you know, biologism. And so I think that I'm sort of using that as kind of like an, a, a way to open up the conversation about this kind of tension between as you're pointing out, aesthetics as this uh, project of differentiation, frequently in the service, you know, um, colonialism, empire, etc., um, versus census communis, a community of taste where where people come together, a kind of commensality, right? Um, and I mean, in a certain sense, like. That I think that's just a sort of inborn tension of the of the project and what of aesthetics is. It's like it's always. I mean, I'm thinking about you know as well um, Edgar and Fred's conversation too. You know that th these are just it just seems to me a, one of these a, a kind of dialectic relation that doesn't necessarily get resolved in that we see at certain moments how this is kind of reinforcing power structures in place, but then it also does at times, as in the case of the recipes um, with Fisher and Dickinson, um, kind of produce some kind of a, a far more expansive community um, and being with than, um, than we would expect from the kind of, uh, pro you know, aesthetics proper, I guess, or the kind of uh, differentiating um, impulse of aesthetics. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't know that there's like an easy answer to that, but I think that it's, it's you know, it's just, I, I think it's sort of hard to kind of, I, I think the, perhaps we just need, you know, part of what I want to do is just kind of embrace that these two things exist at the same time. And sometimes you know, one asserts itself more than the other, and that also one can produce the other, right? That's out of that aesthetics, right? Out of the kind of differentiation, right? Especially in the case of, you know, reading, you know, recipes and, and poems for black cake, um, out of that differentiation does 
you know, that uh, this, this kind of alternate census communist does get produced too, right? That kind of going in and then coming out um, to sort of um, reproduce your gesture, right? Um, and so I, again, I, I was thinking a lot about, yeah, Fred and, and Edgar's discussion about kind of like the colonial archive as well. And that sometimes this is something you have to go into and then you come out of, right? Or not necessarily come into, but you inhabit and sort of reorganize and reconstellate. Um, and so even, and so I just, I, part, of, part of it for me is that there's a kind of um, something of a apprehension I have around, you know, I, I, some, some kind of um, FX studies scholarship where it ends up becoming, um, I don't want to say a, a loophole, but it, it is a way to kind of suggest um, a way of being um, that kind of disclaims or separates itself um, from a particular kind of humanist politics or biopolitics we could be more precise about. And so I think like the challenge for me has always been with this book is sort of accepting that for what it, it like understanding that this is completely inseparable from that, but then also I think via, as you're pointing out, this theorization of the symbolic, like the like a kind of imminent symbol, like a symbolism that is imminent to sensation itself, like that is produced within sensation, and kind of registering, you know, the possibilities for that um, as well. I get, I don't know. I wish I had like a tighter answer for you, Elizabeth, but I just think it's a kind of abiding tension that just I don't know that it can be resolved or even like should be resolved per se. I don't know. Like I feel like it's just sort of what you're thinking. Yeah. The, um, well, I mean, one of the implications for saying that um, sensory experience is a, is a sign is to say that it is held in common because signs are, are, are things that operate um, uh, in common, right? Um, yeah. But one of the questions about the common is that, um, uh, is that you, to me, I, I think you always have to ask what are its limits. Like, um, right. you know, when, when does when does common to whom does commonness extend, and right. when does it not? Right. So, um, so that sort of speaks to that. You know, it's not a, it, it, it's it speaks maybe it speaks to the fungibility of that commonness. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's yeah, and I think to your point, it kind of gets to the common as. Um, of a, a social formation that, or it offers up an account of social formations that don't necessarily or strictly fall along kind of more particular, like more familiar bounds of identity per se, right? That it's a, a community, a commensality, right? In which sociality takes place and unfolds that, um, it's like a minor sociality, we almost like, you know, um, it's it's not key to a particular like political identity or formation, which I think, especially in the 19th century, we're, we're more attuned to sort of those kinds of um, formations, but this is something outside of that. Um, well, I mean, it strikes me that one of the, one of, uh, uh, okay, so the chapters are organized around, you know, roughly around the five senses. And this is something else I want to um, touch on is the, the, the structure you have of chapters and intervals, but, the, um, but what's interesting is that the, the, the you know, the, the chapters where things get a little more um, uh, uh, riotous, you know, um, <laughs> where, where, where there's a, a little less um, uh, of the um, controlled hierarchy around um, sense ha are those sort of um, uh, the more dissolute, um, senses, right? So um, taste and um, and touch, uh, right? So those are the ones, um, uh, and smell to some extent, right? Um, but not uh, uh, sight and uh, and hearing as much. Um, but so so that it suggests. I mean, one of the things that that I find, um, uh, and I think to some extent this may cut across all three books that we're looking at. Um, that, that are you know under this discussion today is that the the question of of what it means to um, think across a variety of um, uh, senses, which is to say um, uh, outside of print being the singular mm. mode of being in common um, or or um, textuality. 
Uh, so to to um, so so one of the things to say that this sensory is a sign is also to kind of open up um, signifying communities that have often not registered as such right. in um, in a kind of uh, um, colonial uh, um, in, a, in a deep colonial history in which um, print is sort of the dominant vehicle of, of, um, of knowledge. Um, okay, so, so, so thinking about the structure of, of your text, you know, you have these five um, uh, chapters, but then you also have the intervals uh, in which you talk about th th these um, synesthetic yeah, intervals, right? So where, um, for instance, taste and, and touch um, uh, intersect or um, uh, uh, um, I'm trying to remember the other ones, but anyways, synesthesia um, ones. Uh, and the, um, uh, so, uh, and I'm just gonna read one um, sentence that I love that's, that, and, and this is sort of thinking about the role of um, uh, literary criticism, right? Mm -hmm. Of this as a critical work. You say that um, literature is a sensitizing mechanism, not merely a representation, but an amplification of experience. And um, so this is one of the reasons why then literature becomes particularly associated with the psychophysics for you, um, uh, which is you know, another reason why messing with the categories then accords a different kind of um, status to the literary, right? Um, but the, but there's also a way, so my question is, is this literary criticism also a sensitizing mechanism, not merely a representation? And, um, yeah. and, and what, is, so this is a little bit a version of the poetics versus critique um, uh, question. And particularly in relationship to this kind of contrapuntal structure that you use across the book as a whole. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the quick an answer, I mean, I was actually thinking of this myself, um, listening to Fred and Edgar, because I mean, I think that liter literary criticism is or can be a sensitizing mechanism. And, and perhaps I think that's borne out um, in a lot of our, poet critics today, especially. Um, and I think Fred had said something beautiful. Um, critique is what happens in the wake of love. Um, I think that, you know, we, so one way to say this is that the, the structure of the book itself, the chapters and the intervals, I, emerges out of the way that I was ultimately trying to take a cue from the archive itself. Um, right, how, and I think it sort of shows that, and my hope is that it's, it suggests that, you know, a model of literary criticism in which archival recovery, or we should just say historicism more broadly, you know, can make possible or activate formal methods and structures. Um, and so my, you know, my intuition is that it can be because it's, you know, also producing a community, right? Um, and it is, I mean, I, you know, I think that it attunes us to um, a critique that is, as, as Fred says, I can't but quote him, right, that, that emerges in the wake of love, which itself kind of amplifies all sorts of forgotten or unforgotten um, experiences. And, and so, yeah, I don't know, that's just something that actually had occurred to me as well. And I was also thinking, you know, with with this relation between like amplification of the experience and language or or the literary or the sign, right? There's there, you know, the literary genre, the the sensory genre are distinct but mutually constitutive structures of relation. Um, but they can also cross cut each other, right? And so in, you know, in for instance. For instance, um, like in the first chapter where I talk about the genre of not seeing um, via this idea, the concept of the body image or the phantom limb, right? And how that mediates, right? Historically specific civil war grief, um, but also then pushes it, you know, the genre of realism, realism and sort of reinscribing, which we associate with reinscribing visual epistemologies. And so then, you know, 
this not seeing emerges as a genre that catalyzes a more psychological realism in, um, in James, even as that genre is constantly producing this gothic liquid in excess. And so, you know, I think a lot about how, in some ways, like the, there's what liter literary criticism, I think, can do, right, um, is something like at the nexus of, <laughs> you know, what we would call the law of genre for Der that Derrida formulated, but also he formulated a law of touch, right, which is that it, both are always in excess of themselves fundamentally, right. And so I think that it's the kind of transduction of energy between the between you know the the uh, the lived, the experiential, and the linguistic, in which they're constantly kind of trafficking between each other, transducing energy from each other, and in doing that, kind of producing modes of relation that, even as they may be distinct, they constantly kind of reinforce each other um, and amplify one another. And so I think that some of the, the literary criticism that we're reading today that we've just heard about um, last hour, I think is such a wonderful model of, of that amplification. Um, so, so I wanted to, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that your book does is that, um, that the, the psychophysics interval is kind of um, uh, from 1860 to 1910 is really mapped onto civil war reconstruction um, and you know that Jim Crow uh, and there's you know that's a it's it's a, it's a really um, I mean you do a wonderful job of kind of putting the, those stories and histories in conversation with one another um, but I was also and this is this is um, uh, just coming out of my my things that I've been thinking about in my own work. Um, so there was this really interesting resonance for me um, around the question of the phantom limb, uh, because the the you know a lot of my um, more recent work um, has been a, thinking about the Caribbean um, and the history of um, uh, racial capitalism on the plantation and uh, settler colonialism, and so um, and and. There's a um, one of one of the the things that appears in this colonial literature with appalling frequency is the fact that um, enslaved workers on sugar mills routinely lost their limbs in the sugar mill because um, and and in fact one of the things that is really um, you know horrific is that in descriptions of the sugar mill, there's also a description of keeping of an axe that is kept next to the sugar mill, because um, the, the, the cane rollers are these giant metal cylinders. Um, and so the enslaved workers had to feed the cane into the cylinders and then off not frequently there would be these accidents, but the fact that the axe was there meant that, in fact, it was part of the process, not yeah. an accident, right? Um, and so, and so the you do mention the kind of blood sugar um, uh, uh, literature, and which is, to my knowledge, is much more common in England than it is mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, mm -hmm. and, um, and there are. It, it clear references to to you know images of say of um, uh, um, enslaved workers with amputated limbs saying this is the this is the price of sugar right so the association between the amputated limb and um, and sugar so the um, it made me it made me think about and also thinking about um, let's say um, Octavia Butler's Kindred um, yeah. or the um, so, so the, the question of what it would mean to, um, the, the role of labor, uh, yeah. as, um, uh, in a, a, an amputation or a loss of limb, as opposed to the role of the military, right? Because the, as opposed to a, a kind of civil war injury, um, that is, uh, that creates or, um, has this kind of ghostly presence of the limb, um, uh, to what extent does that um, 
you know, and, and the, the, the story of the soldier reclaiming his limbs, right? Um, and, and what that means. And, and for me that um, I've been doing some work on the, the narrative of Makandal, who was um, uh, one of the sort of um, earliest figures. Uh, he, he's sort of seen as a, as a precursor figure for the uh, Haitian revolution. And he lost um, an arm in a sugar mill. And as a result of that, he was, um, uh, he was assigned to do work as a, um, you know, as a cattle herder, right? And, um, and he became deeply knowledgeable about uh, plants and then um, deeply knowledgeable about poisoning and, um, and then used that knowledge to, um, uh, it, you know, to, to um, plan uh, this revolution against the plantation owners in Saint-Domingue um, that would involve uh, poisoning the white owners, and and he was um, uh, he was caught and charged with this. Um, uh, and uh, Alejo Carpentier has a has a novel about this, the the Kingdom of this World, and th and the story, the the narrative is that that when Macandal is is being burned at the stake for the this um, crime of um, insurrection, that he escapes and the reason why he escapes is because they can't tie him up very well because he's missing an arm um and 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 then he turns into a um insect and and flies away um and so the the so for me that's a narrative that is about these kinds of um category category crossings right um yeah. And, um, but also it makes me wonder about the fantasy of recuperating the, um, that sort of whole body as a, as a, well, the, um, what was the shield of whiteness, <laughs> but the way that Fred and Edgar were, were um, describing um, uh, Malinowski's posture and that, you know, that, that posture of wholeness versus, um, imagining uh, um, a, a shift shaping alternative um, form of um, embodiment and, and power and flight. Yeah, I mean, it is so, I mean, right, so disability is, is so central to thinking about that. And with the, you know, the phantom limb um, or the, you know, and thinking about alternatives to this kind of colonial, uh, white colonial fantasy of, unitary or, or whole embodiment you know just the the kind of um history that you were relaying you know makes me think about and in a certain way this also kind of folds back into our earlier um conversation about about literary criticism but you know the way that black studies or black cultural studies like the the centrality of the phantom limb and this kind of perhaps category crossing in a certain sense, right? But the centrality of the phantom limb as this figure um, for understanding the kind of dislocations um, of, you know, the, the transatlantic slave trade, like that, you know, begins with Fanon um, up through, you know, Hartman's work and, and Nathaniel Mackey writes, um, has written quite a, you know, a bit about, um, about the phantom limb, especially in Caribbean um, context. And so I think that's just sort of, yeah, it, it tunes us to the, both the very like material histories, the, uh, the, the kind of um, alternate world making possibilities like the, in the in the context of um, being able to escape because you weren't uh, properly tied because you didn't have a limb right so thinking about those histories there's this there's a, always a sort of material history that then becomes a way to bring us closer to the the, the figures that that can sort of um name or sort of better constellate around um the the kind of experience experiential but historical phenomena um 
that continue to haunt us and, and thinking about the sort of the, the afterlives, right, um, of these particular kind of structures. Um, so yeah, that's just, I'm just sort of like thinking with you about that. But uh, I mean, I think the Phantom Limb, right, because it is is sort of a recurrent figure. I mean, I initially came to it precisely because I was reading Nathaniel Mackey and then was realizing that the Phantom Limb was effectively identified or invented, right, um, in the midst of the Civil War. And so I think it's, but of course, that doesn't mean that it wasn't experienced before then. But, you know, thinking about how this it's it's at one it's constantly this kind of exchange between the materiality embodiment and the figuration that actually amplifies what the embodiment means, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, Fred was putting that into yeah. So so Fred, that that also is um, the the diabetic amputation is is like for me is the is the contemporary history of that that moving from the um, production of sugar to the um, enforced consumption of, of sugar or the enforced consumption of um, uh, uh, of of the kind of um, um, you know big agriculture uh, overproduction of sugar and putting sugar in everything every single food in um, in the universe uh, such that um, uh, so th such that diabetes is now a um, um, I don't know what they call it. A, a, a pandemic. Um, I don't know if that's the word for it, but anyway, that the but but I definitely um, uh, thank you for that link because I think that that those two stories are very much um, uh, speaking to each other as well. Um, yeah, the sugar. Yeah, I've got the sugar. Uh, the um, okay. So um, Erica, I was going to ask you, but we're out of time. But I'm just going to tell you anything anyway. I I mean, I see this work as very much contributing to um, a, a really kind of exciting um, and vital thread of scholarship in the 19th century right now. Um, so I just want to um, um, maybe leave it there and say that there's really such exciting work being done in the field of 19th century studies, and and I see. Um, that you're this kind of work that that you're doing here as really um uh as you know as really exemplary and contributory to that so thank you thank you thank you also thank you so much for your scholarship this, this has been integrating and vitalizing for me so thank you um and i guess we'll uh i guess we're going to take a break um i'll hand it over to brian i guess yeah, wow, Th thank you all so much. That was such a, a great conversation and, and the, the research is so fascinating. So yeah, we will um, we will take a break um, and reconvene in 15 minutes um, for our final conversation of the day between Joshua Bennett and Dylan Rodriguez um, at one o'clock West Coast time. Thanks. Okay. Um, welcome back um, everybody. We're having, we're gonna have our last conversation um, between um, Joshua Bennett and um, Dylan Rodriguez um, talking about um, Joshua's um, great book, um, Being Property Once Myself. I'm handing the floor to Joshua. He's going he's gonna to kick us off with this, and then we're going to launch right into this conversation that uh, I'm, I'm going to really enjoy. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, first, I just want to thank, actually, uh, Brian Wagner, the constellation of institutional entities at Berkeley for the invitation. Thank you again to Dylan for being willing to take this time with me and work this thing out um, and to everyone gathered for their time and energy. Real quick, just because I'm, I'm always in the spirit of shout outs, I want to shout out uh, one of my colleagues, Jarvis Gibbons, who just had a book come out, uh, Fugitive Pedagogy. He was trained in the African American Studies Department at Berkeley. Um, and in the spirit of this fantastic contribution that he's made to our field, I want to begin with a visual epigraph and a set of images that honors the social life worlds of Black children uh, and the freedom dreams they enact and make possible. So I'm gonna play a music video for y'all real quick. And then we'll get into these slides. All right, now we get right to the slides. This is four horses. One, C is for cowboys, Lucille Clifton writes, in her 1970 masterwork of children's literature, The Black BCs, 
kings of the West. Some of the black men were some of the best. Clifton's delightful rhyming quatrain is accompanied in the text by the striking image of a black man seated atop a horse in pursuit of a bull running wild across the plains. A man who remains unidentified, but could be any one of the 19th century black cowboys she proceeds to name in rapid succession. Bill Pickett, Jim Beckworth, a man named Simply Joe, who Clifton informs us is the only known male survivor of the Alamo and the most famous of the set, Nat Love. Looking at the image now, I recognized Love from the photographs of him I would see on Black History Month calendars every February. Each year, in some local church or barber shop, I would stumble upon an image of this man with luxurious jet black hair, a look of absolute intractable calm across his face. Like so many black cowboys, Love was a former field hand, his first encounters with horses taking place on the Tennessee plantation of a man named Robert Love. While enslaved, Nat developed a reputation for being gifted at the work of breaking horses, and in the wake of emancipation was able to win a horse in a local raffle, sell it, and skip town. From there, as he moved from Arizona to Texas and eventually California, his legend only grew. Within the scope of my childhood imaginary, love would come to represent an entire history I understood in some vague sense but could barely touch, a legacy of human-animal conflict and collaboration alike, an entanglement born of mutual suffering and ongoing misrecognition. F is for freedom, Clifton writes. Whatever folks say, whoever can give it can take it away, too. In Clifton's text, D is for Douglas, and from its very first paragraph, the famed abolitionist 1845 autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, presents us with a claim that not only calls upon the history of Black people and horses I've invoked already, but is also rooted in an altogether improper juxtaposition given the conventions and central aims of the slave narrative as a form, i.e. to serve as Black humanity's literary proof. Douglass writes, I was born in Tuckahoe near Hillsboro and about 12 miles from Easton in Talbot County, Maryland. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, never having seen any authentic record containing it. By far the larger part of the slaves know as little of their ages as horses know of theirs. This moment of all too fraught proximity between the enslaved black person and the non-human animal positioned here as twin captives affixed by modernity's long arc demands our attention. For what Douglas names is a kinship forged in the midst of unthinkable violence. Kinship born of mutual subjugation, yes, but also the shared experience of opacity mistaken for emptiness. Indeed, one could argue that Douglas is gesturing toward a deep sense of commonality, even comradeship here. Though the horse is certainly a representative of what is lost, it's also an unlikely ally one who shares the experience of existing both inside the parameters of plantation time. The horse is a creature that likewise has no narrative of origin and is thus also constantly moving between the realm of organism and machine, between occupying a space of self-determination and being configured as a living commodity. During a speech delivered in 1873 in Nashville, Tennessee entitled Agriculture and Black Progress, Douglas takes this point a bit further. Not only the slave, but the horse, the ox and the mule shared the general feeling of indifference to rights naturally engendered by a state of slavery. The master blamed the overseer, the overseer the slave, and the slave the horses, oxen and mules, and violence and brutality fell upon animals as a consequence. Douglas goes on to entreat his listeners at the time, an audience composed primarily of recently emancipated Black farmers, to consider animals their co-laborers, friends, partners in the field, to resist the whims of a social order predicated upon their confinement and instead embrace another more expansive form of sociality, one grounded in the desire for a world without cages or chains. And so here, this is an image from Jonathan Walker's abolitionist text, A Picture of Slavery for Youth. And you see the caption, it's exchanging citizens for horses. So part of what I'm trying to work through in the book is what I call this kind of fraught proximity, right? And in particular, in this talk, thinking about the, 
sort of work of childhood imagination and the idea that abolitionists believe that presenting that fraught proximity to children can teach them an indelible lesson about anti-Black racism, okay? Three, in this sense and others, Douglas's horse embodies the central concerns of our conversation today, as well as my larger project. The argument of my book, Being Property Once Myself, is that the overarching claims Douglas is making can be found throughout the Black expressive tradition. That is, that rather than employing triumphalist rhetoric that would askew the non-human altogether, what we often find instead are authors who envision the animal as a source of unfettered possibility or, to riff on John Berger, the animal as a promise. And what does the animal promise exactly? What do Black authors create when they're willing to engage in a critical embrace of what has been used against them as a tool of derision and denigration, to leap into a vision of human personhood rooted not in the logics of private property or dominion, but wildness, flight, brotherhood, and sisterhood beyond blood? Being property once myself is comprised of five chapters, each of which tracks a specific animal figure, the rat, the cock, the mule, the dog, and the shark in the works of several 20th and 21st century writers, Richard Wright, Toni Morrison, Zora Neale Hurston, Jesmyn Ward, and Robert Hayden, respectively. My goal throughout this book is to illumine the ways in which Black aesthetics provide us with the tools needed to conceive of interspecies relationships anew and ultimately abolish the forms of anti-Black thought that have maintained the fissure between human and animal. For this too is what Du Bois might have us think of as the gift of Black culture the gift of blackness, the great chain of being come undone, life itself unfettered and moving in all directions, a window into the worlds that thrive at the underside of modernity. What does the animal promise? Nothing short of another cosmos. A radically different set of relations is possible. As Douglas and others demonstrate, such an order is already here, already in the works, already waiting for us in the wild. The next and final section of the talk is concerned with the contemporary intersections of social activism, visual art, and human-animal collaboration in the lives of a small group of Black horsemen in North Philly, the Fletcher Street Urban Riding Club. Part of my aim in assembling this constellation of texts, images, and lived experiences is to clarify the ways that both violent comparisons as well as unexpected alliances between Black people and animals can be mapped across a variety of spaces, not just the plantation, but also the kitchenette, the prison, the high school laboratory in the neighborhood corner. I want to assert that there are countless Black writers, Black teachers, Black organizers and scientists and culture workers of all kinds that have for centuries put forward a vision of human flourishing that accounted for a multitude of vulnerable life forms the likewise dehumanized and denigrated, what my grandmother might have called the least of these. Along those lines, the title of this talk takes its inspiration from Césaire's claim in Notebook of a Return to the Native Land that, quote, the only thing worth beginning is the end of the world and calls upon the imagery of the four horsemen of the apocalypse towards the achievement of that abolitionist dream. And so it's in the name of the Black Earth the Black shambling bear and favorite daughter of the universe, the Black planet public enemy said we were all made to fear, but have nonetheless grown to love and labor towards, that I want to echo the call of Césaire, Clifton, and countless others toward a new beginning, a new way for us to be in the world together, opaque, imperfect, impossible to apprehend, for the members of the Fletcher Street Urban Riding Club are not cowboys in any traditional sense, but let the current president of the club, Ellis Farrell, tell it, he and his ever-expanding collective of student riders are urban cowboys, inheritors of a tradition of Black riders that spans over a century. And although one online media outlet refers to the club as a youth crime and drug prevention program, in a recent video profiling Fletcher Street, Farrell appears to revise this sentiment taking the claim a bit further and into more interesting territory. You can take a kid that has problems and give them a horse to take care of, and their attitude will change. Their whole life will change. There is something downright transformative, Pharrell seems to say, about the encounters between horses and the young people he seeks to recruit for the riding club. 
some trace of the animal that the students carry with them, even when they are not riding. Pharrell goes on to talk about the organization's intentions to serve these young people, as well as various horses and ponies that would otherwise be euthanized. Pharrell's own horse goes by the name One-Eyed Dusty and would have, according to Pharrell, quote, been sent off to the killers if not for the club's intervention. His term of choice is especially resonant in this context and frames the larger project of Fletcher Street as one firmly rooted in the preservation of what Judith Butler would call precarious life, life excluded from the protections of full human personhood. After spending eight months with these riders and their animal collaborators, the Algerian French artist Mohamed Bourouisa created an exhibit at the Philadelphia-based Barnes Foundation, Urban Riders, intended to reflect the beauty and breadth of their everyday social practice. In its final form, the show was a collaboration between Borowisa and a number of visual artists, all of whom contributed work that was directly linked to the larger festival he created in tandem with members of the club weeks earlier, a day-long event known only as Horse Day. Horse Day is also the name of a 14-minute short film which serves, according to many reviewers, as the exhibit's centerpiece. To my mind, however, the most compelling work in the show is Burroughese's The Ride. The ride is made entirely from car parts. Each panel bearing images of the Fletcher Street Urban Riding Club and their horses. And although Burroughese does not directly reference the specific historical intersection of Black men, horses, and automobiles in the city, the work nonetheless carries the weight of that legacy in its body. According to John Morris, owner of the 40th Street Stables not too far from Fletcher, in the 1960s, many of the local Black men who worked as junk and trash collectors, a number of whom were not a part of this larger community of riders, could not, due to low wages, afford to buy the cars or trucks that would have made their work sustainable. The blur of their entanglement, the bullseye fades. Death does not carry the day. They conjure a world that is worthy of them, and then they gather there, unbowed, unburied, unabashedly alive. All right. Thank y'all. Appreciate that, Joshua. I'm going I'm to jump right in and just state how happy I am that Joshua cited Public Enemy, who's uh, sitting watching us over, over and behind my left shoulder right here. Mm -hmm. um, so shout out, shout out back at you for citing Public Enemy. I appreciate that. I, um, I thank you to Joshua for inviting me to inviting me to be in dialogue with him. And and I think origin stories are important when we have to create them for ourselves. And and mine and Joshua's origin story comes uh, uh just prior to Joshua becoming faculty member uh, officially a faculty member at Dartmouth when um when we met at the 25th anniversary event celebrating Cornell West's book Race Matters, and. This is how we met and we went to the airport together and we got deep into some kind of conspiratorial poetic conversation that ended up forcing Joshua to miss his flight. There's Edgar's boy. What's up? What's up, kid? Um, so Joshua missed his flight, but he still, he, I think you got on. I think you found another flight and you made it. So it could have been a horrific origin story, but this is how we know each other, which makes sense to me somehow. Um, so to think about this book, uh, it, it's a privilege and it's, it, it's, it's a real gift to be in dialogue with Joshua around this book. To me, what it exemplifies is a, is a poetic black radical abolitionist reading practice. Um, and, and, and the reason that's important to me is because I see this as a reading practice that's potentially weaponized, weaponized uh, toward the exposure, the coerced fragility and vulnerability, the disruption of, of what the great you know, black, black radical cultural theorist, black revolutionary cultural theorist, Sylvia Winter has so crucially demystified as the overrepresented anti-black colonial and genocidal genre of man. Um, so so for, for folks here in this, in this, in this setting and, and that might be watching the recording that might be unfamiliar or less than familiar with Winter's work, I'll simply reference Joshua's crystallization of the indelible impact that her thinking has continued to have across fields of practice and thought. Um, he reminds us that Winter shows us how the universalized, violently normalized notion of the autonomous rights-bearing legal person, which some might reference in shorthand as the assumptive subject of Western humanism and modernity itself, 
um, and is, is actually merely the figure of man masquerading as the only viable genre of the human person, right? That, that this is what winter teaches us, that, that, this, that this, this, this universalized human being is the figure of man masquerading as the only viable genre of the human person. So Joshua, the way I read this book, um, I see it as echoing and amplifying the fact of that masquerading. That, that, that this masquerading is the violently universalized category of human being, that this masquerading is the particular colonial and enslaving modality of human being that wages terror and war on all other modalities of being human and otherwise. Uh, and, and what your work is showing us is how it is that in these sites, in these moments, in these imaginaries of terror and war, uh, Black radical being is constantly convening. And, and, and it's that being, it's that radical being that I think you're pushing us into. And the contribution that I think you're making in a really crucial way here is that this is not merely a Black radical praxis of human being. Mm -hmm. uh, rather, it's being in its most supple, promiscuous, wild, and, and therefore abolitionist sense. And you, and you said wildness, right? You talk about wildness in your introductory comments, which is, which is another way of saying that Black being that actively inhabits the condition of animality rather than simply or unilaterally being reduced to animal or chattel status. I mean, this is what you're hit with as soon as you open the pages of this book. Um, so maybe we can start the conversation here with this, with this, um, with, with what I'm actually trying to push, right? I'm trying to push in, in urgency around a weaponized reading practice, which, which is I think the tool you're giving us here. Um, you're showing us that black being in its intimacy with animality is an inhabitation of revolt it's an inhabitation of radical abolitionist autonomy. Right. It is also a productive violence that is always transforming the world by aggressively surviving it. And that's this is what I mean by productive violence, that Black being, Black convening, Black autonomy, and of course, Black insurgency is creative violence against an anti-Black and colonial ordering. And that's, in fact, a necessary ethical violence against the supremacy of what winter calls the genre of man. So, so while you don't necessarily use the terms of weaponization in the book, how can you see this praxis of reading, which is to say the abolitionist praxis right. of interpretation and black being as productive and creative violence against this and every chattel anti-black colonial order? Mm. Well, I see it working from a number of different directions. So I'll start with, I'll start with what you're asking about not just creative violence, but the relationship between sort of violence and creative writing, that makes any sense. So I'm thinking about the fourth chapter of the book and uh, Jasmine Ward, Salvage the Bones, right? Which wins the National Book Award in 2011. It's, wi it's widely celebrated as a text, but the initial sort of pushback around that book was the idea that this is just another tale about a girl and her dog. For people who don't know, the protagonist is a 15 year old black girl um, in Mississippi named Esh. Her big brother Ski that runs a kind of underground dog fighting ring, or rather, he's a part of it in a place called the Pit, right, where these different dogs fight. His dog's name is China, right? She's a, this like white pit bull, absolutely vicious. And the story ends with uh, I don't want to spoil it, but this is you know this important with Esh saying that China is her sister, right? She calls her her kin, and I was really taken by that idea, right? That uh, this book would not be about a certain kind of triumphalism. Right? It's not about them eventually turning away from dogfighting and having a kind of moral awakening. Right, It's actually what about what happens when we linger in that kind of muddiness and murk. And it's also about a way of thinking about one's openness and relationship to violence Right, that says this is not completely separate from what the dogs experience. Right, That they're partaking in that social activity actually has very much to do with how they think about themselves and their own proximity to death living as they do in pre-Katrina, Mississippi, right? So I was taken by that and I thought, all right, well, I really wanna linger there. I wanna think about not only that, but my own sort of growing up in Yonkers, New York, where most of the dogs I knew on my block were also, you know, uh, dogs that people had as part of dog fighting rings. And I thought about Michael Vick and I thought about DMX who I grew up 15 minutes away from him robbing people with his dog Boomer, right? And saying, you know, uh, that he wasn't afraid of guns but that a dog was like a bullet that could chase you. Um, and that Boomer was with him when he wrote his first album, right? Um, in a trap house. And so I wanted to really lift up those kind of low moments, right? Of human animal collaboration that operated outside of the province of propriety and the law and say, well, what would it mean to actually bring a kind of literary 
theory toolkit to bear on those scenes and those images, right? What does it mean to think about the Fletcher Street Urban Riding Club as part of a much longer centuries long tradition of human animal partnership and interspecies solidarity, even though the mainstream media is just calling it a youth prevention, you know, a drug crime uh, prevention program, right? What kind of opacity actually exists and how do we honor it and sit with it? Lastly, you started with winter. I had to rewrite the entire introduction to this book when I met Professor Winter two years ago. Um, and I sat in her living room with Jarvis actually, and we interviewed her for two days. And the first thing she asked was, well, what are you two writing about? Because right? all she knew about us was that we'd written her a letter and said we were working on a special issue of souls about inheritance in Black studies. And I told her, you know, I came to disability studies um, through my family, right, and through the way my family had, had trained me to think about neurotypicality um, and neurodivergence and the beauty and capacity of language. And she was like, oh, well, you need to write about origin stories then. And maybe we need a different origin story for Black studies and its relationship to the animal. Because it sounds like you're also saying that Black studies starts in that moment where Douglas is getting dragged through the wilderness by oxen, right? Not just the abstraction of the animal figure in that moment with horses, but Douglas was actually sort of living outside, right? With, with animal beings. What did they teach him about what it meant to be available to violence, right? So that, that's what I'm trying to keep track of in the book, honestly, and always through through poetry as well as uh, fiction and critical prose. I mean, I'm taking the book in, at, you know, as somebody who who is inundated with close readings throughout my literal childhood, right? That this close reading, close literary reading was was the main way I learned how to argue and how to think analytically, how to do what we would call uh, critical forms of intellectual engagement as opposed to rote memorization learning. So, so in that sense, when, when, I, when I talked to my earlier comments about the book serving as a kind of tool, which I think can be fashioned in, in, a, in, a, in a radically weaponized kind of way, that's what I mean, that, that it, exemplifies, it exemplifies a certain kind of interpretive poetic practice as well as a reading practice. When I say reading, I don't just mean literary, I obviously don't just mean literary reading, right? I mean, reading in the most open and promiscuous shit, we'll use the term wild, the wildest way that we can think of reading, which is kind of what you just gave me in your response to my question, right? That there's a wild way um, to read, which is, which is to say that there's a black radical, there's a black way, a black radical and autonomous way to read this relation, to read in the spilling of that blood. By the way, I, I, can, I, can, I can relate at some level with the intimacy and, and the different feeling around dogfighting because I'm because I'm fucking Filipino man like you you know and I used to be in the Philippines every other summer throughout my childhood and saw dog fights right up close and personal and it's um you're helping give me some some ways to understand what what that feeling was when I was in those places because it, it didn't it didn't strike me as it didn't strike me in the, in the same language as as the way you know this criminalizing language around particularly around black people involved with dogs and mm -hmm. um and dog fighting you know, brings it. But you, you just talked about Douglas, and, and that's a great segue into the next set of, of, of kind of questions that I wanted to think with you on. Um, sure. And you talked about Douglas in the second movement of your introductory comments. And, and, then, and then early in, in the first pages of the book, um, you write this, and, I, and I, I'm going to read this for a second. It's on page two. You write about how, how Douglas gives us a means of getting out of animality by going through it. And you kind of just said this earlier too. Douglas understands, for example, that under the system of chattel slavery, there are structures in place for the care and sustenance of animals that simply do not exist for the enslaved, right? That's, that's, that's the thing that got, me, that got me going a little bit in another way. You, you are, in my mind, what you're doing is you're provoking deeper questions, sustained reflection on the condition of animality us, right? Especially as something that can't be defined through biological categories or species differentiation. I mean, that's the immediate thing that you interrupt so beautifully in the opening paragraphs of this book. And, and here's where I'm going with this. Um, and you got me thinking about this through each of these five chapters, right? Whether it was the shark or the cock or the mule, like all of them, the sense that animals often, frequently, often seem to humans to not give a fuck about things that humans reify as valuable, mm. rare, or sacred. Animals will show us that they do not give a fuck about their own limbs, their own flesh, and their own lives at times. 
and in other instances don't give a fuck about their offspring, mm -hmm. right? But there's usually something about this modality of being that makes sense beyond the instance of limb preservation, right? Of bodily integrity, and for that matter of life and death, or even of suffering. In other words, animals do give a fuck, just maybe in ways that aren't legible to the genre of man, mm -hmm. right? They may be less, they may be semi-legible, meaning the animal way of giving a fuck. It might be semi-legible to other modalities of human being, maybe particularly to black being, but can you help us work through this? The giving a fuck, the animality of giving a fuck, or maybe a refining, a refining of how mm -hmm. we encounter the not giving a fuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think Hurston is attuned to this as well, right? So I write a little bit about Matt Bonner's mule and the mule funeral, right? So on the one hand, we get this gorgeous scene about mule heaven, right? Where there's this critical reversal where mules ride on the backs of humans, right? So there's that sense of care and investment. But what happens in the material realm, right? The buzzards gather around the mule's corpse and just tear them apart, right? They say a few words, right, to honor them. And then they tear him to shreds. And there's something there, I think, that Hurston's trying to communicate about the relationship between ceremony and brutality, right? And animal life worlds. It's saying it's actually not this kind of um, sanitized relation. She gives you the critical philosophical reversal of mule heaven, but then says, but here on earth, right? It's, it's about flesh and blood, right? And can you survive? And that's the lesson I think she wants us to take away from the mule funeral, right? Is that the, there's something also the townspeople understand about that, right? About precariousness as something that is just always with us. Um, and the way we navigate that is our investment in one another and not always along lines of, of blood kin, right? Often, you know, in the space of black social life, which part of what I'm trying to communicate in the book is I think that extends beyond the, the bounds of, of species, right? That blackness is in part about that shared precariousness, but it's also about, I think, um, that sense of opacity mistaken for emptiness, right? That it's, it's sort of unclear for people who operate primarily through the logistics of an anti-Black world, what a Black person is, right? They can't really imagine Black possibility, Black complexity, Black brilliance. Um, and that's part of how I get to the readings of, of Bigger Thomas, for example, right? I say, actually, there's this whole literary history of people reading these very strange anti-Black tropes onto this character that I want to upset. Because when we linger in the space of those anti-Black tropes, of course you think, oh, well, Bigger is just the rat, right? That he kills in the beginning. And that means that he's doomed, like all Black boys are doomed. I was quite shocked as a graduate student to see that that had been the spirit of so many readings. And I thought, well, I mean, as someone who grew up around rats, I was like, well, that's not all rats are, right? They're not just doomed to death. They're incredibly quick. They're flexible, right? They can squeeze their bodies down, right? To the thinness of a coin to slide through a door. So, I mean, rats are kinesthetically brilliant, right? And then when I looked at Wright's haiku, I realized, well, rats are doing all kinds of other stuff in the poetry too. So I, I don't think for him um, that being a rat and that comparison between bigger and the rat is just about openness to death, right? Perhaps it's about fugitivity. Right? and fugitive practice, and how we think about fugitive practice in the face of certain death every single day. So that that's what I, I felt like was a kind of animal, a theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it, it, in, in, part, in part of what, in part of what your words just now were, were provoking for me was, was um, thinking through another relation to the terror of, 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 you know, of what Spillers famously calls the flesh, right? Which is another central, central, central framing concept in, in this book. But but it's that, it's that, is that remapping of the flesh and a resituating of a relation to the terror that makes flesh. Um, that 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 in that scene of ceremonializing the death of the mule just prior to what what's supposed to, you know, what, what kind of is supposed to be this, 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 you know, horrible terrorizing sequence of the mule's flesh being picked apart by, by these scavenger birds, right? But there's something else about it, which, um, which speaks back to the terror with a certain kind of parodic, almost satirical lightness, you know, but it's also, but it's also, it's also something that communes. It actually does the work of communing around this absurd, because the flesh is, the flesh is absurd in this terror-making way, 
-hmm. right? The whole presence and vulnerability and the the uh, the the um, disposability of it, right? Yeah. Just just the bi that's the biological real of it is 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 actually what terrorizes the man. What terrorizes man? That's what terrorizes that dominant genre of human being, right? Sure. It's it's that it's that vulnerability, the bio the the bio the, the bio biological you know erosion of it you know it's availability for consumption by other forms of animal especially by animal being by animal being especially right so to ceremonialize that gets gets at something else um yeah. and that's yeah and, and that that that's something that lurks throughout the book um if, sure. if you don't yeah if, if 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 you can follow me in this in this other strain that the book had me reflecting on um you know, given given the historical moment that the book is is being published and is and is now being read in, uh, I I couldn't help but but reconsider, and, and I mean in a really foundational way, reconsider how how man's construction of the human animal divide induces the institutionality of policing. Mm -hmm of policing, right? As both a state specific apparatus, right? So as an apparatus, but but more important, I think in, in, in the way your book made me think about it, policing as a modality, as a modality of power and dominance. Right. Um, you, you got me thinking about the human animal relation in terms different from the mastery of nature and wildness, right? And you, and you put us there, right? You say this, it's not reducible to that, that human animal relation. Right. And, and you got me thinking about how to center the epistemic and physiological, ecological violence and violation mm -hmm. that's central to the very assertion of the human versus animal differentiation, that it's a policing relationship, mm -hmm. right? That the animal position is both policed and always in the spectrum, therefore, of destroying policing, of destroying police authority, and, 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 and maybe of destroying the police themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, this seems to also be black positionality within modernity as well. I mean, this is this is the other side of anti-blackness, right? This is the other side, this is not even the other side. This is what anti-blackness does, right? It's what anti-black, it's what policing as the foundational relation or one of the foundational relations of what we call anti-blackness as, as a kind of dense shorthand. It's part of what it does, it says that, the, that there's a kind of positionality to, um, to, to black communion, including ceremony, including ceremonies around flesh, ceremonies that speak and back and maybe in some interesting ways convene around the terror of flesh, mm. um, that 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 mobilizes this, um, this 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 radical disruption of of the policing modality. Um, but I want to know if you thought about this in in, in any way as you as you develop um, each of the chapters, right? But that, that that relation, the policing relation. Sure. I mean, I thought about it a bunch with the dog chapter, in part because I mean, dogs are the role of dogs, right? Right. They're yeah. used for canine squads, right? They're used yeah. to yeah. drugs. They're used to attack protesters, right? Um, oh, slave catching, slave catching. Dogs are central right. to that. I mean, yeah, across right. across the diaspora, across right. the, across the hemisphere. Right. And part of the reason my father is afraid of dogs, right, is because he integrated his high school in Alabama and dogs were sicked on them, right? They were sicked on children yeah. uh, and adults alike. And so I've been thinking a lot about how, how is it even possible for him to develop a kind of affirmative relationship to dogs at all, given that lived history? But th that's part of what I'm interested in in the book as well. How do Black people reclaim those relationships in new and affirmative and imaginative ways, given the use in particular right, of animals by the police state, because horses are also used by police, right? Animals are, are well integrated <laughs> uh, into police forces, right, as ways to not only engage in crowd control, right, but as ways to enforce, you know, drug laws, which we know by and large, uh, you know, affect Black people in disproportionate ways. Right, so that that's one thing I was definitely thinking about as it pertains to um, animals and policing, but also the way that the line is policed between various categories of animals. Right, so another way to think about how the the book is broken up is sort of uh, pests, property, and pets. Right, that's and how right. Even, even within the category of something like dog, you've already gestured toward this. Right, pit bulls are not considered a uh, potential white kin. Right, pit bulls are racialized, right, quite yeah. actively in a way that's very different from golden retrievers, for instance, right, the kind of dogs you would see on a show like Full House. 
I'm really interested in, in that too, right? How are animals themselves racialized largely through the, right. the logic of, of anti-Blackness, right? How do certain species and breeds of dog come to be associated with racialized populations um, and thus denigrated, right? Black dogs are less likely on average to be adopted. I mean, all of, the, all of these sorts of things, I think are clue to the fact that when we're talking about anti-Blackness, we're not just talking about race, right? Um, Sylvia Winters, no humans involved again. Yeah, that's right. When we're talking about policing, right, and animalization, yeah. it's the literal code that LAPD yeah. used. Well, 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 I mean, what this gets us at is that is that is that the that's that so-called racial differentiation, particularly the differentiation of blackness, right? The singular category of blackness has never been an exclusively or even necessarily primarily human differentiation. Yeah. That's at the very roots of it. You know what I mean? As as a discursive category, and this is predating it becoming a kind of pseudoscientific. Um, epidermalized, you know, eugenic category. But if we just think about this differentiation of Blackness and whatever was understood by the Western civilizational project as Black being, it was never reducible mm -hmm. to the category of human or even of the distinction between those who are to be uh, kind of privileged as humans and those whose humanity is going to constantly always be held in abeyance, right? Or held in question and whatnot. Um, but, but, but just listening to you respond to my question now, I mean, it's, it's, in thinking about the kind of genre categories of animality that the book walks us through, right? The book thinks us through, the, the book kind of celebrates, that shit can't be policed, mm. right? So the thing that gets, so, so what you got me realize, the thing that, 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 that works as police power is the differentiation of human and animal. That's, that's the assertion, that is the assertion of police power. But then you think about the fucking rat, right? That, the, the mob of rats is a fucking nightmare. Mm -hmm. That shit cannot, you can't police that. Anybody knows that. You can't police that. You can't, you can't practice police power against that. Any, anybody who is in that industry will tell you, yeah. right? Anybody who's in the industry around, you know, that has to deal with rat, they will tell you that, that you can exert some, lack of a better term, some crowd control. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can try to induce some riot control with sure these rats, not. but they're not going anywhere. You might kill a whole bunch of them, but there's a million more where they came from. So, so there's that. So, so in a way, what police powers, what, what police power already sees as its own undoing is sometimes the assertion of the differentiation, the distinction, in this case, human and animal. But that's the, the biggest nightmare of police power is, is, is the um, uh, uh, kind of the insurgency of the animality, which is already present all the time anyways. Right, which, which, is why, which is why the assertion of the difference becomes the only way that police power can actually assert itself is in the differentiation. It can't actually control that shit, right? You can police the distinction, you can't police the being, mm. right? And, and so, it's, this, so this, is, this is where there's something beautifully dangerous about the work your book is doing in getting us to think about black being in intimacy with animality, you know, through animality, through mm. animality, right? Is that there's something about it that, that is, um, constitutively already, um, al already, already doing the work of fugitive, insurgent, and anti-police self, anti-policing self-determination, maybe anti-police too. Yeah, I mean, you're making me think, I mean, because the pest is about a certain relationship to property, right? That even animals that we might consider beautiful, you know, Bambi, deer can be pests if there are enough of them, right? And if they're damaging property. Right. Pigs go from being, I mean, is that that famous meme about sort of feral hogs, right? I mean, pigs go from being yeah. a food animal or livestock to potentially being pests when they're a swarm, right? When they're a real danger. Audre Lorde does this beautifully in her poem, The Brown Menace, right? It's a persona poem from the perspective of a cockroach, right? And she says, I'm your urge to destroy the indestructible part of yourself. Like the pest, uh, is, it's a representative of what will survive us. Right? Well, we'll survive the human species. Lucille Clifton, in the beginning of the end of the world, she gives us a sort of snapshot right, of, of nuclear war, right? the day that the bang of the end is what she calls it. Right? And there's these roaches that just sort of look mournfully at the human beings and march in a long line away. So the pest is also a threat because they expose the desire for human immortality as the myth it is. Right? And that's much the same way that blackness is, is, exposes that myth, right? exposes that lie. We're all going to die. How do you live and die with dignity? That's, right. that's the question. That's right. That, you got me going. So, so this is another thing that I, that I, that I, that I have to ask before, before our, our time runs out in the next 13 minutes. Sure. 
so we've been talking a lot in the book thinks a lot about sociality about these forms of sociality within and through animality that this is this is a way of producing um uh, uh, a modality of being that that refigures relations with flesh with mortality and with ceremony right mm -hmm. but but you're also doing something else that i that I'm, I'm struggling to get my head around so i'm hoping you can help me right i'm hoping you give me a little tutorial here <laughs> because i think you're, you're also you're also challenging challenging us um to think sociality within and through animality to refigure our relation to time and historicity historicity I let, me, let me fixate on historicity for just a second right because what i'm thinking about is how historicity is generally reserved for the human being mm -hmm. um and and particularly for the human being in narrate in, in, in narrativizing its mastery over animality and wildness in some ways that's what historicity is <laughs> you know what i mean in, in, in its infrastructure in its foundation that's what historicity is intending to tell the story of is that human being the man man's mm -hmm. mastery over animality and wildness but on the other hand, intimacy with animality cultivates a certain, I don't know what to call it, if I should call it an anti or a counter historicity that may have something to do with the experience of, of, of temporality in and of itself in these, in, 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 in working in and through animality. But can you, can you help me try to get my head around time and historicity here, temporality here? Yeah. I mean, I, I can try. I mean, cause you're making me think about decomposition. Right, like what yeah. are the kinds of <laughs> of yeah. tempos and ways of thinking about time that animals force us into, either in a moment of danger, <laughs> right, or mm -hmm. even when we have companion animals, right? Thinking about something like dog years, mm -hmm. right, makes us think very differently about how one accounts for one's life and not just time as sort of a, or one's time on Earth as a sort of sequence or of achievements. Because I hear the word conquest seems to be in the background of what you're thinking, right? Yeah, it's a series of conquests. Um, and achievements and victories, but rather what does it mean to just think about us as, as being at war with motion, you know, just constantly turning, constantly wearing away. Animals expose that vulnerability in us, right? That fundamental inescapable truth that uh, we won't be here for very long. And that too is what I think I'm, I'm really trying to capture in the book. And I think it's why Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon begins with a failed flight. Right. Right. She returns to birds over and over in that book, and none right. of them achieve true ascension, right? That's it's right. It's all what she calls like janky flying. Like it all, that's it all right. falls apart. And that's incredible to me because it's really about Milkman learning to die, right? Falls into the killing arms of his brother, right? At the end by surrendering. He has to surrender to the air so he can ride it, right? But it's only for just a moment. So yeah, it's, it's a very different way of thinking about historicity temporality and what it means to, to be a human subject right to be a human you, person you know and, and this this maybe can lead us into the into the into the last movement of our conversation because mm -hmm. um i think a lot of this has to do a lot of what you have had me thinking about has to do with with this particular historical moment in which your book enters the world sure um right that we're we're, we're in a moment of acute heightened global insurgency mm -hmm. that is rapidly being commodified funneled into you know reformist revitalization of public confidence in in police power mm. um that that's being that's being rationalized through these liberal narratives of once again right of of, of inclusion and of, of of equity and of addressing disparity and all these all these all these terms of reformism that end up reinstituting man yeah. they end up reinstituting the ascendancy or the universality or the kind of militarized normality of, of, of what we call that genre, that overrepresented genre of man. I mean, that's what this fucking project always is, right? It's to quell, to quell the wildness, yeah. to narratively and materially funnel the wildness into something which can be civilized. And I mean, civilized in the multiple registers of that term, right? Both passively and actively. Uh, but, 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 but to think about, but to think about how your book gives us multiple interpretive reading and narrative tools to not concede that okay and and i think this is this is the interesting tension we're seeing now i believe with some of the witness testimonies in the derek chauvin trial right there's some shit going on in the witness testimonies in the derek chauvin trial which escape the kind of liberal state narrativization of police accountability All right you know what I mean? I mean, this is this is and, and I don't just mean 
the kind of transcribed text of what people are saying. I'm talking about I'm talking about the gesture, the breath, the performance of these testimonies. There's an unapologetic, I would say, counter and anti-police and proto-abolitionist wildness, something which is unapologetic, which is working in and through a certain kind of animal relation to police power um, that, that cannot be domesticated, that there's, that there's something there that cannot be, and there's a scramble that's going on right now, right? That's why you have, I think, one of the only times you'll ever see it, that you'll have the police chief, in this case, a Black police chief who's going to come and testify against one of his own, you know, one of his own officers, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't, doesn't happen. That almost never happens. But there's a scramble to try to re-domesticate and civilize the wildness around this scene. And um, can, can, can you talk for a minute about, about how you've experienced the particular historical moment in which your book has entered the world? And then, and then, and then we can think through that and I, I can maybe close with one more question at that. But I just, I just wanna really give some time and attention to that, to that aspect of this, of this book and how it's circulating right now and how we're reading it for the foreseeable future. Sure. I mean, the book really started in some ways with me thinking about Black self-defense, right? Reading people like Henry Bibb. And when he turns to the animal, he's thinking about how the snake can strike back, <laughs> right? right or the bird can fly away. I mean, it's all about the idea that a certain, a certain vision of human being is about foreclosing those sorts of possibilities. It's saying you have, you know, no self to defend. You have no body that has any value, you are not loved, yeah. you are not cared for, right? Um, and that's also, I think, what the circulation of these videos can do psychologically to us, right? It serves to reinscribe a certain kind of powerlessness. And I was editing, you know, final edits for this yeah. book, you know, during during this moment, right? During the, the, the lockdown is when the, the book came out, right? And how was I interpreting it? I mean, the uprisings were happening right outside my window, you know, That's in, right. in Boston, right? And we we went outside and we were a part of it in the grass and under the open air. And it, it made me think quite differently about what it might mean to resist the whims of, of that social order, right? Another kind of, uh, of host or swarm, right? That could not be contained and cannot be stopped, right? And that would be configured, of course, as pestilence, right? As pestiferous life that had to be stopped. And that's what I hope the book can contribute, especially to abolitionist organizers and thinkers, right? To say that these are ancient questions and we're writing a new origin story for ourselves about a world, like I said, Douglas, I think is gesturing toward without cages or chains for all of us, right? And that often, you know, when I was younger, people would use words like speciesism. Sometimes it, it seemed like a way to not talk about settler colonialism or white supremacy. And I was saying, well, right. this, this human that you're talking about dominates all animals. We just know that's we know that's not true. You talked about sort of court testimony when Michael Dunn, right, the killer of Jordan Davis, he he only sort of broke his voice twice on the stand. He started crying about his dog, Charlie, yep. and how much he would miss his dog, mm-hmm. right? But testified for hours about killing a young black boy over the, the loudness of his music ostensibly, yeah. right? That's a certain kin relationship he has with that animal that he can't ever imagine black people entering. And that's what we're up against. And that's what I'm trying to articulate in the book, right? That we have to nuance our terms for thinking about those distinctions because they're not obvious, right? And they're insidious and they're ubiquitous. Abolition is a fucking animal act. Yeah. I, that's what I'm starting to believe. I, I mean, in, ter- in terms of in terms of when abolition, when abolition gets gets mobilized in a particular kind of way, mm. it, it's 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 an it's an intimacy with with the animal the animal's insurgency against that policing relationship with the human and man. Um, that's 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 what it is. And so, maybe to close it out, um, I'm I'm fixated on the last part of the book subtitle, "The End of Man." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. I'm fixated on that. I've been fixated on since way before I read the book, but the book helped me just understand my fixation. <laughs> so. So I'll say it again. I'm adding your book to my small, it is a small, selective, but growing collection of handbooks on what I would consider guerrilla war against man. Mm. Um, and, and, and this is, in most ways, a very different handbook for me to use in that ongoing guerrilla war against man. And when I say that, what, what, I'm, what I'm realizing, in part, I'm actually saying, when I say guerrilla war against man, what, I, what part of what I'm really saying is animalized war against civilization. 
that, that that's the only way, that's the only way in which to wage what we might call abolitionist, abolitionist struggle against civilization is it, is it actually has to work in and through animality and the animal position um, and the an, and animal intimacy, yeah. animal intimacy. And again, I'm accessing this in a different kind of way because I, you know, I'm, I'm Filipino, but I think Filipinos have another, 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 another kind, maybe, I don't know if it's roughly analogous. I don't know if it's comparable. I don't know what term to use, but, but I can, I can feel it. I can feel this kind of intimacy with animality sure. um, that I'm in constant struggle with because of everything around us that try so hard to domesticate and rationalize, right? To bring things, to bring things back into the language of justice, social mm -hmm. justice, to bring things back into the language, even of, even of revolution in the traditional sense of revolution. Um, but maybe to close things out, you can, you can give us some ways of trying to build um, a dynamic pedagogy around, around this, um, uh, that, 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 you know, again, you're reminding me again why the work of close reading is indispensable to planning revolt against man, to planning revolt against the genocidal order that man has made. Yeah. Um, you're reminding me that we are in the textuality of man's order, which is to say that we're also in position to take apart, to erupt, um, and maybe make that order incoherent to itself. Mm -hmm. So my intent is to use your book as instruction, to use it as a handbook or an aspect of guerrilla war, and I don't merely mean within the university or college classroom. So have you thought about a poetic, of, or could you think about a poetics of guerrilla war against civilization in this project and beyond it? How can you help us think of waging it now and always? And then we'll close it out that way. All right. I guess I want to start by saying something about Black music, because we haven't talked about it a lot. But I taught Stevie Wonder's Journey Through the Secret Life of Plants earlier this week. And it got me to thinking about those pockets of the tradition where Black writers and artists are telling us to listen to the earth, right? Not even just to the animals, but to listen to the trees and to believe that they have a story to tell us. And that part of the overthrow of this present order of things is absolutely about a kind of return to the dirt. Um, a return to metal and stone and water and air in a real way. It's thinking about kind of a non-exploitative, intimate relationship with non-human life worlds that will require us to open ourselves up. Uh, and for me, it's the poetry that always brings me there. I set out to write a book about novels and every single chapter has poetry in it, right? And the move from dissertation to book was to add a chapter that was all about sharks, right? It was about Hayden, Tolson, and Zandria Phillips making us turn to the middle passage, right? To the blackness at the bottom of the ocean, right? To the untapped unknown and saying, well, that's maybe where we need to begin, right? In absolute darkness, right? With the utter opacity of the animal world and say, what would it look like to start from there as a kind of poetic enterprise? To say, we are opaque to one another and that perhaps is where organizing can begin, right? In that unknown space. And it's something we work on every day, right? To build that intimacy through, through practice. But that's the end of man, right? The presumption yes, right. Uh, that one can, that can possess knowledge of how all things work and how all things will go. We have to relinquish that. Um, and that relinquishing happens together. And it happens through study uh, and practices of study uh, that happen in real life with us gathering together on screens too. Um, but part of what I'm excited about in this return, hopefully, right, in the coming months, is that we'll have opportunities to think together about what we've learned through sitting alone, often in stillness and silence, and these new forms of knowledge that can emerge uh, once we're together again. Hey, so I love you. I want to say I love you. Love you too, brother. Um, and I want to say that I appreciate so much how this project and how your work is reminding me that the end of man is imminent. It's already present in all these ways, that it's in the wildness that's right in front of me, that's right in me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's in me. Um, I think this is, this is what people who are coming to terms with what abolitionist labor and practice looks like right now, especially folks who are new to it and the folks that are the old heads, right? People like me that have been trying to do this work for 20 something years. We need to come into that intimacy with not just the animality you're right, but with the wildness too, because that's where, that's where the imagination and that's where the practice and that's where the presence of abolitionist um, being already is. So I, I just want to express to you how much I appreciate that. Um, and hey, I apologize for going two minutes over time, y'all, but I think it was worth it.
Nice. Hey Joshua, you're coming to my class in the fall. I'm gonna make you. I'm gonna make you talk to my class in the fall when I teach. Let's do it, time. man. Back to Cali. Right. I can't wait. All right, all right. I'm gonna hand it to Brian. Thank you, thank you, Joshua. This was. This was thank great. you. This is great. Wow. Um. Thank you all. Um. That was. I have so many ideas running through my mind right now. Um. So I. I just want to say. Um. Thanks to. Thanks to everybody. You know. Thanks to Edgar and Fred and um, Erica and Elizabeth and Joshua and Dylan for being here. And but also for like just bringing so much to these conversations. Um, it was a really, um, it was a really um, great experience. Um, and so, um, uh, yeah, and thanks to, thanks to everyone else for coming out. Um, and um, yeah, right, we'll see you down the road. <laughs>